chapter six part two section one of a defence of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter six the new realism part two section one so far it must i think be admitted that where the logic of the new realist meets the logic of the monist the encounter has been apparently to the disadvantage of the monist hitherto the monist has either neglected mathematics altogether or he has seized on them greedily to nourish his appetite for dilemmas thus his position becomes vulnerable from the first moment when the mathematician cuts off his nourishment at its source by solving the dilemmas it remains to be seen whether his idealistic monism has sufficient vitality or sufficient command of other resources to survive the blockade his ultimate and complete overthrow must follow if he has no other resources than the slender synthetic methods he has employed hitherto if that is to say he stands or falls by the entire epistemology of the past it must follow in any case whatever his unexplored resources if the new realism succeeds in its attempt to make the laws of pure mathematics binding on a universe which as known and experienced is anything but pure and if it succeeds in keeping those laws secure from the assaults of any countering analysis which may reveal in them a secret contradiction and dilemma i do not say if its doctrine of pluralism and its account of knowledge in general and of immediate perception in particular should hold water for i think it will be found that so far as these do not follow as corollaries from its mathematical arguments they have been deliberately arranged to correspond now there is no doubt that the idealist's habit of rash synthesis has laid him open to attack whatever happens to the constructions of the new realism much of its critique of the older idealism must remain as perhaps the most vitally important and necessary work that any philosophy has yet done this is why i shall consider this part of it in rather more detail than the slight form of these essays warrants readers who have no taste for abstract thinking will do well to skip the next thirty pages or so for i warn them they will be taken over a very dry and difficult piece of ground at the same time they should remember that we despise abstractions at our peril there never was an abstraction so abstract that it or its kind was not at some time or other the burning centre of man's passion and even now it may be that our hope of god and heaven and immortality and the present existence of our very selves hang on as thin a thread we will begin with mr bertrand russell's criticism of the monistic theory of truth for it amounts to a criticism of the monistic theory of reality the monist says that the truth is the whole and mr russell argues that if this is so no part of the truth can be true when mr joachim says that the truth is one and whole and complete it means as he says that nothing is wholly true except the whole truth and what seems to be isolated truths such as two plus two equals four are really only true in the sense that they form part of a system which is the whole truth the truth that a certain partial truth is part of the whole is a partial truth and thus only partially true hence we can never say with perfect truth this is part of the truth hence there can be no sense of truth which is completely applicable to a partial truth because everything that can be said about a partial truth is a partial truth thus the complete truth about any part is the same as the complete truth about any other part since each is the whole truth i do not know whether every monist would accept this statement of his position he ought not to admit the very first construction which mr russell has foisted on him as it stands but he would i think amend it thus nothing is wholly true of things that are wholes except the whole truth by which he will secure his position when he defines reality as the whole he would distinguish between isolated truths and isolated facts and while admitting that truths artificially isolated by logical analysis may be wholly true as far as they go he would insist that if facts could be isolated torn from the living context in which they are born and by which they continue if they could be stripped bare that is to say of their relations no truth could be known about them at all 
thus he would deny that isolated facts and the whole truth can be made to run logically on all fours for instance though it may be wholly true that water consists of h two o one in chemical combination it is not the whole truth about water it is not the whole truth about hydrogen or oxygen and by this time he would begin to see that the trap that was laid for him is a logical quibble turning on the whole truth and wholly true the only construction that he would accept without reservation is the last the complete truth about any part is the complete truth about any other part since each is the whole of truth the point which monism and pluralism will contest forever is the point at which the complete truth may be said to have been reached for the pluralist if he is logically consistent there can be no such point since the parts of his universe are infinite for the monist it cannot be reached anywhere short of the absolute we shall see later on that the pluralist reaches it everywhere by the erection of an infinity of independent absolutes to go back to the assault on mr joachim my monist has accepted the first and the last construction put on him it is in the intermediate propositions that he would be likely to suspect the humorous parody of his position what seem to be isolated truths such as two plus two equals four are really only true in the sense that they form part of the system which is the whole truth the truth that a certain partial truth is part of the whole is a partial truth and thus only partially true hence we can never say with perfect truth this is part of the truth the monist who believes that nothing is wholly true in his sense except the whole truth is not bound to deny that two plus two equals four is part of the truth he is only bound to deny that it is the whole truth about two and about four and that the whole truth about two and about four is the whole truth about number and that the whole truth about number is the whole truth about reality he would insist that if you isolate that apparently self-evident proposition about two and two in such a way as to ignore the other isolated truths about number for instance that sixteen plus sixteen equals thirty-two or four divided by two equals two or even that seven times seven equals forty-nine you have only a partial knowledge of two plus two and again he would protest against the quibble that turns on taking a partial truth as equivalent to partially true but the sterner problem for the monist arises when you isolate all the truths you know about number from all the truths you know about quality and find that although within their own holes none are completely true when torn from their respective contexts yet the whole set of arithmetical truths and the whole set of qualitative truths stand apparently on their own feet and in the most perfect isolation and independence if it were not true that two plus one equals three it would still be true that water consists of two parts of hydrogen to one of oxygen that in this case we should have considerable difficulty in measuring the parts is not any argument from the pluralistic realist point of view wherever water is there will be h two o one whether you measure and number them or not in the same way the numbers two and one and three and all the relations between them would persist as eternal realities and all the truths about them would be eternally true whether there were anything to be numbered in the universe or not in this case the numbers would still have the resource of numbering each other and yet without quantity so much hydrogen to so much oxygen without proportion which can be expressed by number the qualities of water cannot be you cannot except by an artificial logical analysis tear those two holes apart therefore they are not holes they are only complexes knit together with all their several complexities into the structure of the universe isolate them not from each other but from that greater whole and what independence and what reality will they have that is the crux the pluralistic realist says they have their own reality and that is enough the monist says that in that state of dismemberment they have no reality they are only appearances reality is the absolute whole of spirit or of some consciousness which alone holds them together both agree that somehow or other they are together the monist says or ought to say that they can only be separated by an arbitrary process of abstraction it looks as if the realist rashly supposing that the idealist is always talking and thinking about ideas had taken for granted that he could be floored by an argument that rests on an unreal abstraction 
whereas the world the monist is considering is the same real and related world the world of intricate connections and mutual dependencies and correspondences of things linked and platted together and interwoven and separable only in thought nobody is contending that the truth two plus two equals four is an unreal abstraction or that it is not a holy and eternal truth if all the other truths about number are holy and eternal too or that a partial truth is not true as far as it goes the idealist is i think well within his rights in protesting against mr bertrand russell's use of the terms the whole truth and a partial truth as equivalent to wholly true and partially true the destructive force of mr russell's argument rests on this dubious equivalence and on nothing else let us take things as they are in the concrete it is wholly true that mr bertrand russell is a brilliant mathematician but it is not the whole truth about mr bertrand russell mr bertrand russell is more than a brilliant mathematician he is a brilliant logician he is a brilliant writer he is unfortunately at the present moment a pacifist and he is a number of the other things besides he is a pluralistic universe in himself but he is a universe a whole and that he is a brilliant mathematician is so far from being the whole truth about him that it is not the whole truth about the brilliance of his mathematics which is inseparable from the brilliance of his logic if we knew the whole truth about mr bertrand russell we should know why he is a brilliant mathematician and logician we should even know why he is at this unfortunate moment a pacifist what we do not know about all this brilliance is its inevitableness as a quality of mr bertrand russell mr russell would point out that our proposition can perfectly well stand alone that it is wholly true and sufficiently significant in itself and i do not see that the monist is pledged to deny this even while maintaining that we are as far as ever from the ultimate truth the ultimate reality of mr russell mr bertrand russell and his mathematics and the rest of it is an instance that serves the monist very well for the personality of mr russell is precisely that sort of spiritual whole he has in mind when he declares that the whole is present in its parts and that the parts have no complete significance apart from the whole whether he has grounds for maintaining that the reality of the universe is of that nature remains to be seen meanwhile when mr joachim the monist quoted by mr russell says the erring subject's confident belief in the truth of his knowledge distinctly characterizes error and converts a partial apprehension of the truth into falsity he certainly lays himself open to the attack of mr russell's brilliant logic but he is deserting the game of monism and stating a private theory of truth all that his metaphysical theory commits him to is the statement that if a man believes a partial truth to be a whole truth he is in error and he is in error precisely in mr russell's sense his error consists in a false judgment about reality the confidence of his belief has nothing to do with it except so far as it is calculated to keep him in its error according to mr bertrand russell the unfortunate monist has no means of distinguishing between truth and error the two propositions bishop stubbs was hanged for murder and bishop stubbs used to wear gaiters are for him on the same level of truth and of reality the monist who looks beyond the partial truth that bishop stubbs used to wear gaiters to that whole episcopal phenomenon of which gaiters are but a part has no logical grounds for denying that bishop stubbs was hanged for murder and yet the monist's grounds are the same as anybody else's grounds and he has the same right to them if he were defending bishop stubbs from a charge of murder he would appeal not only to the integrity of the episcopal phenomenon but to the whole of the evidence the whole sequence and conglomeration of facts by which it is established beyond doubt that bishop stubbs did not as a matter of fact commit murder that murder and bishop stubbs are in no possible way connected cannot be said with perfect truth since bishop stubbs shares the common humanity of all the murderers that ever were in their hypothetical ultimate reality as immaterial beings there is no difference except a numerical difference between all those murderers and bishop stubbs and in their hypothetical oneness in the absolute with which numerical identity has absolutely nothing to do there would be absolutely no difference between them all the same as an apparition wearing gaiters in space and time bishop stubbs could not and did not commit murder so far mr russell's arguments have been destructive only to a monism of logical abstractions 
the quantitative finite whole which is the sum of its parts the numerical one the abstract absolute they have no grip on the hypothesis of a real living whole a real absolute a real unity of finite and infinite a real spirit immanent or transcendent but mr russell has another and more formidable argument he deduces the whole doctrine of monism from the axiom of internal relations every relation is grounded in the nature of the related terms mr russell says that monism stands or falls by this axiom and tries to show how impossible it is that it should be stood by the discrete monist will therefore think twice before he gives his assent to it for it is the weapon mr russell is coming out to slay him with perhaps he will think of certain obvious relations between subject and object cause and effect the thing and its qualities between premises and conclusion subject and predicate or between positions in space and sequences in time and will say without a moment's hesitation yes of course the relation is grounded in the nature of its terms for surely the terms of a relation imply each other that the subject a perceives the object b implies that it is in the nature of a to perceive b and of b to be perceived by a even though nobody knows what that nature is and though the relation remains forever mysterious that a is the cause of b implies that it is the nature of a to cause b and of b to be caused by a it is the nature of such and such premises to lead to such and such conclusions and of such and such conclusions to follow if it were not the nature of a to have the quality b it would not have b and b must be such a quality that it can belong to a the same will hold of subject and predicate in every statement made with regard to truth if a is eternally to the left of b and therefore b eternally to the right of a there is something eternally in their natures which make these positions eternally possible they must that is to say be material objects occupying space and conditions so as to occupy it in that particular relation or if these positions are only temporary then there is something in their natures a tendency to move or a tendency to perish which makes these positions tenable only temporarily in saying all this the monist may think that he has stated both the correct and the common sense view of relations remember he has not yet committed himself to any explanation of their mystery and all the time he is playing disastrously into mr russell's hands first of all it is assumed that he does not distinguish between the terms and the nature of the terms in this case he is floored with the same arguments which were brought to bear against his theory of the whole and the parts on that theory he cannot make a true statement about any relation between two terms without knowing all the relations in which each term stands to all other things and without knowing all other things which enter into that relation say it is the relation of perceiving subject to object perceived he cannot say with perfect truth that a perceives b without knowing how many other subjects b is perceived by and then he hasn't got further than the two terms there is still the relation of perceiving he must therefore know all perceiving wherever perceiving occurs he must therefore know all subjects perceiving and all objects perceived i have taken a relation which by its very simplicity and comprehensiveness is most dangerously exposed to mr russell's attack but it is clear that his argument applies with equal ferocity to all the other instances that have been given again if relations are grounded in the nature of their terms there can be no diversity of things consider the relation of diversity a is different from b therefore b is different from a simple unqualified difference cannot be predicated as a common adjective of both they must be different in some way mr russell does not say so but his argument requires us to consider that a and b differ in some way they have then different predicates in what way do the predicates differ they have different predicates in what way do these different predicates differ they have different predicates in what way but as it is clear that the process must stop somewhere for even mr russell's pluralistic universe would not provide the differences necessary to follow up the infinite regression we are driven to the conclusion that a and b are not different from each other neither are c or d or e or f in fact there are no two things that are different from each other it follows he says that there is no diversity 
and that there is only one thing thus the axiom of internal relations is equivalent to the assumption of ontological monism and to the denial that there are any relations wherever we seem to have a relation this is really an adjective of the whole composed of terms of the supposed relations in other words things are predicates of one thing it follows that the one final and complete truth as he says must consist of a proposition with one subject namely the whole and one predicate but as this involves distinguishing subject and predicate as if they could be diverse even this is not quite true and this is assuming that the monist does not distinguish between his terms and their nature if with a misguided subtlety he does distinguish them then the same pitfall awaits him for then not only do we have the same trouble that we had just now with a and b but the terms and their nature will enter the relation of diversity with all its consequences of infinite regression if he sticks to it that the term and the nature are one term then as he says every true proposition attributing a predicate to a subject is purely analytic since the subject is its own whole nature and the predicate is part of that nature in that case what is the bond that unites predicate into predicates of one subject any casual collection of predicates might be supposed to compose the subject if subjects are not other than the system of their own predicates End quote finally monism is challenged to account for as mr russell says the apparent multiplicity of the real world the difficulty is that identity and difference is impossible if we adhere to strict monism for identity and difference involves many partial truths which combine by a kind of mutual give and take into one whole of truth but the partial truths in a strict monism are not merely not quite true they do not subsist at all if there were such propositions whether true or false that would be plurality End quote. on the other hand if we accept the realist proposal and give up the axiom of internal relations if we give up monism mr russell says identity in difference disappears there is identity and there is difference and complexes have some elements identical and some different but we are no longer obliged to say of any pair of objects that may be mentioned that they are both identical and different in a sense this sense being something which it is vitally necessary to leave undefined we thus get a world of many things with relations which are not to be deduced from a supposed nature or scholastic essence of related things in this world whatever is complex is composed of simple related things and analysis is no longer confronted at every step by an endless regress End quote. these passages i think show that mr russell has not really grasped the monist position the endless regress is the very last thing that the monist desires to give up his insistence on the endless regress is sufficient proof that he is no more out for a supposed nature a scholastic essence than the pluralist the sense in which he declares two things to be both identical and different is something which it is vitally necessary to his theory to define he has no earthly interest in shirking the definition his sense is not the pluralist sense and they are therefore arguing at cross purposes his multiplicity his difference refers or should refer always to appearances to the manifestations of reality for him identity and difference does not mean that two manifestations are one manifestation but that there is one reality in two or if you like in an infinite number of manifestations his monism may be wrong or it may be right but it is not self-contradictory challenge to account for the apparent multiplicity of the real world his answer must be that it is apparent and not real and that the world of appearances is not the real world when he is told that partial truths in a strict monism do not subsist at all because if there were such propositions whether true or false that would give plurality the retort is obvious precisely it is incompleteness that gives plurality plurality is the expression of partial truth as for the bond that unites predicates into predicates of one subject he might ask in his turn how there can be such a bond without identity and difference and talking of casual collections how does the pluralist propose to make his collection stick we shall see later on that he cannot do it without recourse to the very principle he repudiates 
still it cannot be denied that a great deal of this critique is formidable it is the heavy artillery of a ferocious enemy out to slay and i think it must be owned in humility and contrition that idealism has brought it on itself by its increasing thinness its more and more exclusive cultivation of epistemology hegel as william james admitted has thickness as fechner has thickness but his followers have persisted in following the very path he warned them off the narrow way of abstract intellectualism that leadeth to destruction in the barren absolute they have tried as if their master and kant before him had lived in vain they have tried to build up a universe out of those very categories of the understanding which hegel himself had told them were unfruitful they have stopped at the third book of his logic where all the categories are rounded up in the absolute idea and have not pursued the game of the triple dialectic any further it does not seem to have occurred to them that in the logic hegel is only getting into his stride and that if they are to play the game they must go on till nature and thought together are rounded up in the absolute spirit which is god an absolute as thick as concrete as the universe itself thought itself which in hegel's hands is alive and kicking becomes sterile and motionless under their treatment End of chapter 6, part 2, section 1, recording by Expatria in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 6, part 2, section 2 of A Defense of Idealism by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 6, The New Realism part two section two now it may turn out that there is no such thing as spirit or that if there is it cannot play the all-embracing part assigned to it but anyhow hegel's assumption of spirit made all the difference to the successful working of his dialectic whereas his followers distrust the dialectic and their tendency has been to drop it and to drop the assumption in the interests of what they believe to be a sounder logic and it is at least a question whether their logic though far simpler is really sounder hegel's thought relations by whatever unsafe a priori process he arrived at them really did relate because they are themselves related because they are moments in the manifestation of spirit links between its imminent and transcendent life his followers have turned them into logical abstractions and abstractions are hard unyielding things unsuited to the rhythmic and elastic play of spirit and so having stopped short where the hegelian plot is thinnest though hegel's logic is still considerably thicker than say mr bradley's they fall an easy prey to any philosophy that takes account of such things as nature and life and will and sense and passion and moral behaviour the organic whole is not a whole and cannot by any manipulation of the terms be made to do duty for the whole their internal relations are so far from being internal that at the first touch of analysis they seem to fall away from the things they are supposed to constitute or at any rate to hold together their unity is not a real unity for the simple reason that the supreme and ultimate form of it their absolute is not a real absolute as abstractions thought relations are specially vulnerable to analytic logic which can be trusted to produce off its own bat as many more as may be wanted and to deal with them after their kind when the monist asserts that all relations are grounded in the nature of their terms he starts with a rash generalization and when he stakes all his hopes of his absolute on the dilemma of the infinite regress which ensues his absolute is in a perilous state the position is attackable from above and from below you have only got to show him one relation equally abstract which is not grounded in the nature of its terms and you have mined the very foundations of his dilemma or if he takes his stand on a relation that is so grounded then with the first step of his regress he is again in the thin air of abstraction and the superstructure of his dilemma is exposed to any opponent who presses on his attention some irreducibly uncontradictious definition of the terms 
thus the ingenious analyst has him either way for it is clear that if the relation is grounded in the terms and the terms are irreducible the relation itself is irreducible while if the relation is not grounded in its terms it is irreducible to begin with and this irreducibility of the whole complex holds up his regress at the start yet so far is monism from being vanquished that this game of abstractions has one great and glorious advantage for the monist two can play at it and as we shall see it is a game at which ultimately the realist stands to lose that both sides are dealing in abstractions is evident from the realist theory of the monist theory of relation philosophers mr bertrand russell says and by philosophers i think he means monists seem really to assume though not so far as i know explicitly that relations never have more than two terms and even such relations they reduce by force or guile to predication mathematicians on the other hand almost invariably speak of relations of many terms and mr russell both assumes quite explicitly and argues that a relation of many terms is incompatible with any monistic theory of relation you would have thought that the wider and more complex the ramification of any one relation and the more terms you could rope into it the more unity would triumph but no you have only to abstract your mind from the relation and fasten it on the terms to see at once that it is pluralism that scores and so it does if you have given into the proposition that a relation can exist apart from and independently of its terms and when the realist has shown that this separateness and independence is found in the most intimate and sacred of all relations the relation of subject and predicate the conclusion is apparently forced on you that the game of monistic idealism is up idealism seeking unity before all things is supposed to have assumed faithfulness in the union of subject and predicate realism on the lookout for plurality finds on the contrary that subjects are polygamous and have many predicates while there never was a predicate yet that could remain faithful to one subject for very long the rose is red but so is the dawn and so is bardolph's nose and unless you adopt the realistic theory of universals you are in danger of arguing that the nose and the rose are not red because redness is not a rose nor a nose in short the relations of most subjects and most predicates are temporary and fortuitous and their behaviour from the point of view of monism and monogamy an open scandal therefore the pluralist argues you had much better agree with him that relations are irreducible and independent entities and that so are their terms but there is no reason why monism should be assumed as banking on the permanence of these unions except on the further assumption that it stands or falls by the theory of internal relations if the relation of subject and predicate is grounded in their nature clearly the relation must be permanent subjects and predicates must not chop and change now though the statements of certain monists may have given some grounds for the assumption it is not justified by monism itself monism does not stand or fall by the doctrine of internal relations it stands or falls by the dilemma that is to say it stands or falls by the dilemma involved in the opposite theory the realistic theory of external relations or rather by the dilemma inherent in the very idea of the thing and its relations no predicament short of the double dilemma will really serve given the double dilemma you are confronted with the plain illusion of all relative existence in chapter two page twenty one of mr bradley's appearance and reality you will find mr russell's argument against the doctrine of internal relations turned in precisely the same way with precisely the same plausibility against the doctrine of external relations thus even at this apparently profitless game of abstractions the monist scores seeing that the double dilemma so advantageous to him is disastrous to his opponent for realism stands or falls by its freedom from dilemmas and from contradictions so what are we to say when on one page of the principia mathematica we read the whole doctrine of subject and predicate is radically false and must be abandoned 
and on another page in that chapter four to which the context refers us for the definition of thing every term which is here equivalent to every thing to begin with is a logical subject again every term is immutable and indestructible what a term is it is and no change can be conceived in it which would not destroy its identity and make it another term so that as some terms on mr russell's admission are also predicates every term must be what it isn't contrary to the definition if a monist had made a statement like that he would never have heard the last of it and there is no reason why he should not have made it since the contradiction involved would help him rather than not but it is very far from helping mr russell and if we go on we shall find him involved in contradictions that would make the fortune of a monist thus he says we shall say that socrates is human is a proposition having only one term of the remaining components of the proposition one is a verb the other is a predicate it is implied then that a predicate is not a term yet in the preceding paragraph terms are divided into things and concepts and concepts into adjectives or predicates and relations or verbs there may be terms that are not predicates but how on earth can there be any predicate that is not a term predicates then he says are concepts other than verbs which occur in propositions having only one term or subject End quote. for if two terms were allowed in subject predicate propositions there would be unity in difference therefore contrary to the definition it is not to be again he says when a man occurs in a proposition for example i met a man in the street the proposition is not about the concept a man but about something quite different some actual biped denoted by the concept thus concepts of this kind have meaning in a non-psychological sense and in this sense when we say this is a man we are making a proposition in which a concept is in some sense attached to what is not a concept End of quote. we are that is to say involved in what on a theory of immutable and indestructible terms is a contradiction but is not a contradiction on any other theory but after all the analyst has some uneasiness about this most crucial question of the subject predicate relation if we were right he says in holding that socrates is human is a proposition having only one term the is in this proposition cannot express a relation in the ordinary sense in fact subject predicate propositions are distinguished by just this non-relational character End quote. you see the realist's implacable hostility to the subject predicate relation just because in it there lurks a secret danger to his pluralism still mr russell is a most honest and honourable logician and he owns very handsomely that nevertheless a relation between socrates and humanity is certainly implied and it is very difficult to conceive the proposition as expressing no relation at all we may perhaps say that it is a relation although it is distinguished from other relations in that it does not permit itself to be regarded as an assertion concerning either of its terms indifferently but only as an assertion concerning the referent End quote that is to say humanity is not exemplified in socrates otherwise it would be implicated as a term but it is so hard to know says mr russell what is known by relation that the whole question is in danger of becoming purely verbal End quote. hard indeed if you are a pluralistic realist bent on eliminating unity at all costs one more admission of the analyst apropos this time of organic unities the existence of which he strenuously denies it is said says mr russell that analysis is falsification that the complex is not equivalent to the sum of its constituents and is changed when it is analyzed into these in this doctrine there is a measure of truth when what is to be analyzed is a unity a proposition has a certain indefinable unity in virtue of which it is an assertion and this is so completely lost by analysis that no enunciation of constituents will restore it even though itself be mentioned as a constituent there is it must be confessed a grave logical difficulty in this fact for it is difficult not to believe that a whole must be constituted by its constituents End quote he comforts himself with the reflection that 
for us however it is sufficient to observe that all unities are propositions or propositional functions and that consequently nothing that exists is a unity End quote. it is the monist may observe not sufficient for him and he would point out that the consequence is not so rigorous as mr russell seems to think also i think he would suggest that the whole question of how knowledge is possible hangs on this admitted unity of the proposition and propositional function how does the amazing multiplicity of the real outside universe get itself expressed in propositions or in propositional functions if in that universe there is no unity to correspond if the pluralist is allowed to assume that every logical atom discoverable by his atomistic logic tallies with or constitutes an atom there why may not the monist just as well assume his logical unity to be there also and to the whole atomistic critique he may reply all this is mere analysis and you yourself admit that analysis of a whole is in some measure falsification is it likely then that after the damage you have inflicted on my universe i shall not hold you tight to that admission and to all that it implies if the parts of the whole are really its parts if they are as you admit presupposed in it in a sense in which it is not presupposed in them for i grant you that in a sense the whole is a new thing though not that it is ever a new single term except provisionally as part or as one of many aggregates in a larger whole then the relation of the whole to its parts will still be more intimate more vital than anything that analysis can show and it is precisely this intimacy and vitality that analysis destroys and surely it is this intimacy and vitality that logic itself discerns and acknowledges when it is driven to the conclusion that in the last analysis the analysis of collections when the whole is only completely specified by its parts the relation is peculiar and undefinable so peculiar and undefinable that when the precious collection consists of but a single term we are still compelled to think of that term as contained in a whole does it not look as if the whole were as necessary to the part as the parts are to the whole as for your arguments drawn from multiple relations from propositions containing many more terms than two and from many subjects with one predicate and many predicates with one subject i do not see that they necessarily make more for your ultimate pluralism than for my ultimate monism i am not obliged to look for my unity anywhere short of the absolute therefore it really does not matter to me how many terms a proposition contains nor how you distribute and arrange the relations of subject and predicate analytic logic then has not entirely smashed up even his system of abstract thought relations but supposing that it had the monist's only legitimate concern is not abstract relativity but concrete relatedness the bare fact that the universe is contextual that all things in it that is to say all things within the range of immediate perception and of logical induction and deduction are in some way connected interdependent and related his claim that each is related to the absolute in one way the way of the appearance to the reality is a just claim the further claim that they should all be related to each other in one way is the suicidal mania of monism it is to ignore their place in the relation it is to tear them from the context in which they appear and are known in which we are obliged to perceive them and to think them it is to isolate them and thus turn them into abstractions which at once become the prey of analytic logic for every abstraction set up within the sphere of the related is a little tin pot absolute the monist is even worse off with his claim that every lesser whole should have the clear illuminating penetrating truthful quality of the whole for this is to create a series of little tin can holes which are none the less isolated and none the less abstract for being set up inside the relation nevertheless since two can play at this game it is with a plurality of such little tin pot absolutes and such little tin can holes that the new realism builds up its universe or to be strictly correct it is such a universe of little tin can holes and little tin pot absolutes that it claims to have discovered now there is no reason why the monist when he is not a subjective idealist should not take a hand in this game of discovery too 
there is in fact every reason why he should claim to have discovered for his part a universe where nothing is isolated nothing is absolute and where nothing is contingent and conditional that is not related in some way to something other than itself he would do well to accept and acknowledge the frank plurality of such a universe instead of patching up little unities and wholenesses inside it where unity and wholeness are not and creating little infinite regressions and supererogatory dilemmas for himself as he goes along then in the face of the infinite regression the endless chain of contingencies that he finds and does not create he has every reason to plead that in such a universe there is no moment of self-subsistence that it escapes from moment to moment the diamond net of thought that terms should be every bit as dependent on relations as relations are on terms and that this relativity is proved rather than disproved by the pluralist's ability to play ducks and drakes with subjects and predicates he will maintain that this is a purely spectacular universe in the sense that it has every appearance of being an appearance rather than a spontaneous and automatic reality that in short its relativity cries aloud for the absolute and its multiplicity for unity he will define his rich and concrete absolute as that which is not related to anything other than itself such an absolute can only not enter into relations because it is all relations and all terms and is more than the sum of all terms and all relations only such a whole is absolute and only such an absolute is the whole thought is perhaps the thinnest and the poorest predicate of this ding an sich it is quite clear that such an absolute escapes the net of thought by so much as it is more than thought realists will of course deride the suggestion that it escapes the net of analytic logic by so much for in one sense it does not escape logic can dislocate and lay out in fragments the whole world of its appearances and i confess i do not see how the monist is to stick it together again with thought relations or to round it up into one whole of thought he cannot conjure the universe out of such feeble propositions as that thought is unity and unity is thought or that absolute spirit is thought because thought thinks it for on the same showing a pluralistic universe would be a universe of thought the monist's only chance is to abandon his epistemology even if the alternative has to bear the dreadful and dishonoured name of spiritualism End of chapter 6, part 2, recording by Expatria in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 6, part 3, section 1 of A Defense of Idealism by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 6, The New Realism, part 3, section 1 but even with the complete abandonment of epistemology the monist position is untenable if the new realism can make good its claim at all the other points along its admirably defended line if that is to say it can prove its own hypothesis of the independent self-subsistent reality of the world as external to any and every form of consciousness for that hypothesis if made good rules out his as to say the least of it superfluous why look behind the veil of appearances for ultimate reality when there isn't any veil when realities as ultimate as you are ever likely to get are spread out under your nose and absolute being is planted out all round you in embarrassing quantities but are the foundations of atomistic realism after all so very sure it is just possible it may prove after all more vulnerable than it looks for to begin with it gains an immense advantage from the fact that in spite of the influence of mr bertrand russell it is not a one-man philosophy as hegelianism and kantianism were one-man philosophies it is difficult to bring criticism to bear on a theory that is not yet built up into a system you know where you are in the critique of pure reason by merely looking at the headings of the parts and sections you can find your way from kant's basement through all his floors to his transcendental attic by a process as simple as going upstairs 
but the new realists though no doubt they all have the same architectural plan in their heads are not yet housed under one roof the american symposium of six suggests a colony of young men's christian association huts rather than a solidly built and many-storied house of thought the stain is not yet dry on their walls and the corrugated iron is very new so far not even the mathematical philosophy of mr bertrand russell is completely systematized the timid monist wandering among their scattered habitations never knows what disaster may lurk for him behind some door or window the critic of the new realism has to arrange it according to his own plan and it is open to any new realist to complain that his arrangement is wrong but at any rate it falls into two main divisions its critique and its construction it must be owned that its critique has accomplished something if not quite all that it set out to do it has completely shattered subjective idealism or solipsism not a very difficult or a much-needed enterprise and its particular success would be hardly worth mentioning but for our new realist very evident and very naive belief that certain arguments fatal to subjective idealism are equally destructive to idealisms that are not subjective it has destroyed a great deal of the abstract epistemology that superseded hegelianism and it is hardly likely that there will ever be any return of idealism in precisely that form it may even be conceded that in all probability there will be no return of idealism at all for another generation unless the excesses of the realist produce a violent reaction it has in short swept away so much old rubbish that any future idealism must reap the benefit of the space cleared for it its constructive half lends itself to five subdivisions the organon or atomistic logic the mathematical foundations the theory of space and time matter and motion the theory of universals the theory of sense perception for reasons which will appear i shall consider these in their reverse order i do not think this is taking an unfair advantage of a philosophy which has not yet got itself systematized since the new realists have declared their position to be impregnable at all points in justice to them however it should be remembered that their theory of sense perception rests on the mathematical foundations which again rest on their atomistic logic hence the impregnability it must be borne in mind that atomistic logic the bedrock of the entire philosophy is purely formal now since the mathematical foundations are pure and sense perception admittedly is not is it impertinent to ask how the one can be based upon the other mind is not more different from matter than mathematical points are from a point perceived in an extended surface let alone that they are not and cannot be perceived at all neither are they the causes of sense perception if anything is a cause in the external world it is the behaviour of the ultimate constituents of matter in public space and it is difficult to see how mathematical space in its purity and absoluteness can be in any sense a condition of the behaviour of matter further on the theory there has to be in any case an adjustment of private spaces to public space surely this is a pretty active and constructive work on the part of a perceiver who on the theory is supposed to be a passive spectator of ready-made realities outside himself again if all atomistic realities even when they are relations are such very absolute and ontologically speaking self-repellent entities it is difficult to conceive how they come together in one undivided act of perception the realists will no doubt say that they come together because they are together and that they are never in perception at all so let us put the problem in another form how are they in their absoluteness and plurality related to that single and undivided act when on the theory the relation of these relations is itself an outside entity in vain the realist decentralizes the entire performance he has got his problem at the periphery instead of at the centre that is all we know that his is not naive realism like the realism of the bonhomme reed it is indeed realism of the most highly sophisticated sort 
but all its sophistications do not disguise the essential naivete and difficulty of its problem things aren't as easy as all that the new realism leaves that problem precisely where the old realism left it for idealism to solve as best it can let it not be supposed that my monist is a naif idealist he does distinguish between subjective hallucinations and objective phenomena or if the realist likes between subjective and objective realities but this distinction is for the moment beside the point we are dealing now with objective realities to give them their courtesy title with independent outside things with the carpet which exists in the room and the room which exists in space whether i or my neighbour for that matter are or are not in the room beholding these existences the new realist is mistaken if he imagines that any idealist who is not also a solipsist supposes for one moment that these appearances cease by his absence and are revived again by his presence what he does suppose is that if all sense perceptions changed or ceased all sensible qualities would change or cease also and that if his ultimate and absolute reality which he calls absolute consciousness or thought or spirit were to cease the whole universe of its appearances would cease with it but as on his theory he cannot conceive of it as ceasing the question has no more significance for him than for the realist that is to say on his theory the universe will not and cannot abate one pulse of the energies one atom or one shade of the qualities that for the realist constitute its claim to be considered real until it or any one of its essential constituents are annihilated idealism does no violence to the dignity and decency of science or to the plain man's sense of reality it leaves all these matters precisely where they were but what does realism do it divides what for science and the plain man's sense were never yet divided it joins what for them were never yet joined it talks about irreducibles and undefinables where science and the plain man see palpable unities and relations it gives to the abstractions of its own logic a reality as august and far more permanent than the solar system it perpetuates the old fallacy of arguing that what is outside a human body is outside all consciousness and that what is inside human consciousness is therefore inside the human brain it swears by psychophysical parallelism yet it regards consciousness as a mysterious and unnecessary spectator of external events a spectator who only departs from the purely passive role to manufacture tertiary psychic qualities which have no physical parallel still let us suppose that it gets its backing from the higher mathematics and that it is irrefutably true philosophy is then in an even worse position than it was before kant faced with a universe of realities of which an infinite number are harder and more irreducible than brickbats utterly different from and independent of consciousness a universe which has contrived to exist by itself for infinite ages without being known and superlatively indifferent as to whether it ever is known or not which at some moment of finite time is suddenly confronted with an infinite crowd of finite knowers utterly unnecessary to its existence utterly mysterious in their origin yet demanding an origin by reason of their finiteness the fact of knowledge becomes once more the intractable problem of philosophy with no hope of tackling it as kant tried to tackle it at the knowing end it is as if kant had been shut up with wolf in wolf's library and had gone to sleep there with nobody to wake him from his dogmatic slumber when the new realist in his realism says that kant's slumbers if everlastingly prolonged would have been no misfortune for the human race since idealism has had no effect on physical or mental science he is confusing physical and mental science with philosophy it may be doubted whether the realism of the twentieth century is going to have any effect on physical and mental science either seeing that these have hitherto managed to get on very well without it whereas realism owes much of its alleged security to the support it professes to receive from physics and applied mathematics but before considering its security we must look closer at its treatment of the problem of immediate perception 
it is no longer berkeley's question of how realities hard as brickbats contrive to penetrate from an outside world into an inside consciousness which is tenuous and tender since on the theory they do not penetrate into consciousness at all nor is it kant's question of how synthetic judgments are a priori possible since it is not for judgment to make any synthesis at all but only to look on and constater so far as there is any synthesis at all the synthesis is performed with efficiency by realities themselves now unless we remember that this theory has a high mathematical backing this part of it looks almost too simple and easy to be true and we must admit that there is something fascinating and even plausible in its simplicity and easiness it also looks stated thus without reference to the higher mathematics as if it were a question-begging theory still it would be unfair to press that point as idealists may claim an equal right to isolate a theory for observation but the realist is dodging the issue when he argues that the existence of hallucinations of red carpets in consciousness that are not in the room is no objection to his theory it is an objection as we shall see and a fairly formidable objection but it is not the crucial one hallucinations on any theory may be supposed to arise from a flaw or a kink in the apparatus of perception from something that is to say abnormal but the true crux in the normal and permanent memory image the faithful reproduction of the spectacle that arises as the spectator's subjective response to the stimulus of those nerve and brain cells that were associated so mysteriously with his uninterrupted view of the original performance the realist cannot say that this repetition of the spectacle is taking place in public space nor in that private space which is adjustable to public space red carpets are in his consciousness now at any rate that is to say they are subjective in the sense that his memories are not my memories or anybody else's memories but though subjective they are spatial they are extended and they are red to be spatial then to be extended to be red are not hallmarks attaching to things that exist only outside consciousness they are after all properties also of things that arise in consciousness i think the new realist can hardly argue that memories arise anywhere else but if he does he will get an infinite regressus of outside simulacra and no genuine memory at all genuine memory should one would imagine be saturated with subjectivity and in the experience of most of us genuine memory is i do not ask him how he distinguishes between the memory of the spectacle and the spectacle itself he distinguishes precisely as the idealist distinguishes by the difference of the complexes in which each occur for one thing he distinguishes by the very saturation which he ignores as being of the essence of memory but i do ask him how he reconciles the fact of their common share in all so-called primary and secondary qualities with his theory that these qualities only exist independently of consciousness and outside it this objection cannot be met by simply saying that the original sense data their images in memory and what he may call dream spectacles and hallucinations are all equally realities but of different orders it is their likeness and not their unlikeness that is the problem hallucinations are important in psychology over and over again abnormal occurrences have been our guides to the laws and the significance of normal behaviour hallucinations the new realist says can be referred entirely to some kink or flaw in the apparatus of perception the apparatus of perception can then produce of its own initiative a very tolerable imitation of reality a power which it really ought not to have if the realist's account of perception is the true one still dream consciousness can do as much or more and in neither case is perception of a real outside object involved but take hallucinations of the lesser sort the temporary distortions and duplications of perception which we are all familiar with perception mind you of a real outside object these also are due to some kink or maladjustment of the apparatus easily corrected the new realist says by readjustment or by reference to the real object the error is in the false judgment of the perceiver 
no doubt but the possibility of correction is really not the point the point is that the apparatus is important we have here not the simple affair of spectator and spectacle that realism supposes there is a go-between a medium and the medium can distort it can duplicate we would not be aware that there was a medium if it were not for its occasional aberrations and its abnormal behaviour is the clue to its normal functions the medium then distorts or duplicates what the realist says not the real object an image of the object realism has no use for images in immediate perception it has ruled them sternly out the appearance of the object then realism says that in perception the appearance is the reality agreed that it is the apparatus the medium itself that is duplicated or distorted and we are where we were before perception is still as much the thrall of its apparatus as of its object if its duplicate for the experiments are accidents which yield duplicates amount to its duplication and i am giving realism the benefit of any doubt there may be on this point if the duplication of the medium can make one perceiver perceive two objects and if its distortion can make him perceive the real object as if it were distorted if its correct adjustment is essential to his correct perception of the object it is clear that his perception of objects correct or incorrect is not precisely what you might call immediate how can he then be sure as cocksure as the realist is that he is perceiving a reality and not an appearance and when we consider the pure sense data those secondary qualities which realism declares to be not warm intimate sensations but objects of sensation planted out and no more at home in consciousness than the north pole is the old problems turn up again as persistently as if the new realism had never arisen to solve them for if disregarding the apparatus of perception we take the new realism's primary secondary and tertiary qualities as simply as it would have us take them we shall not find the tertiary qualities which it admits to be subjective divided off from the secondary or objective ones as sharply as we should expect on a theory which distinguishes between realities dependent on consciousness and realities not so dependent on the contrary starting with the tertiary qualities and working outwards from the subjective centre we pass through a reaction zone of tertiary qualities merging into secondary in a gradation of shades so subtle as to defy the arbitrary division that realism has set up the aesthetic feelings wonder admiration and awe the passions and emotions love desire fear pleasure and displeasure and disgust are not qualities that realism would dream of planting out in the objects that excite them and it requires some stretch of imagination on idealism's part to realize sound and color hardness and heaviness as sense data rather than as sensations and it requires a bigger stretch still to plant out tastes and odors in the particles of matter that excite them but what about heat and cold supposing the idealist agrees that it is the fire that is hot and the air that is cold and not the idealist then when by imperceptible gradations the fire grows hotter and hotter and the air colder and colder and pain is his reaction to the higher intensities of the same stimulus is he to plant out the pain into the fire and the air i suppose the realist will say he need plant it out no farther than his own body but even that is too far for the intimately subjective thing that pain seems to be besides you have now left it unsettled whether the heat is in the fire or in his body if the new realist says that obviously it is in both then how about the pain how are you to distinguish as secondary and tertiary between the heat that is outside consciousness and independent of it and the pain which is in consciousness which without consciousness would not and could not be and you can take all the secondary qualities and increase their intensity with the same result intense light and sound taste and odour will bring about violent reactions your objective secondary sensations merging into subjective tertiary agony what is more your sensation of primary qualities will behave in the same way increase the heaviness of your suitcase or the impetus of your contact with the table 
and heaviness and hardness will pass into sensations that are not sense data at all as the realist defines them the problem is not affected by the consideration that in all these instances notably in that of the suitcase and colliding table your body is the medium of the reaction realism cannot get over the damning fact that somehow at some point the transition from primary or secondary to tertiary from outside consciousness to inside consciousness has been made realism allows for the transition from secondary to primary qualities by its theory that extension is colored and can be perceived as a sense datum what it refuses to admit and cannot account for on any theory either of psychophysical parallelism or of reality independent of consciousness is that all these unbroken transitions taken together constitute a very considerable whole for consciousness while the performance is fairly explicable if we suppose that consciousness takes over the whole show end of chapter six part three section one recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter six part three section two of a defense of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter six the new realism part three section two we must now consider the realist doctrine of universals when it will be evident that there was good reason for taking his theory of sense perception first from their place in the logical programme of realism it might be supposed that the theory of sense perception followed from the doctrine of universals as the doctrine of universals followed from the atomistic logic but the consequences are the other way about thus in the chapter on the world of universals in mr bertrand russell's problems of philosophy you find the theory of sense perception relied on to support the theory of the independent existence of a relation which is a universal it is true that realism finds its universals and does not create them it is also true that if its universals did not exist it would have had to invent them without them its theory of sense perception will not hang together for a moment for assume a consciousness that brings no bridges with it whose sole business is to find and to constater there can be no logical passage from one atom of reality to another perception of outside reals cries aloud for conception of outside reals in order to make both memory associations and judgments possible so the one is used to bolster up the other to constater is impossible without concepts and concepts must be universals in order to ensure that the reality perceived at this moment and in this space is the same reality which was perceived the moment before or at any period of time before or in another space supposing it to have changed its position the universal therefore must be out of time and out of space it is that which has the same meaning in all contexts in which it occurs universals thus serve as standards or tests of the identity of reals they are plato's patterns laid up in heaven now i think idealism ought to acknowledge that it has no grounds for quarrelling with the new realism here it ought rather to be grateful to it for restoring universals to their ancient place of freedom and purity and splendour there is something about a universal that has always provoked the derision of the playful empiricist bishop berkeley thought there was something downright funny about a triangle that was neither oblique nor rectangle nor equilateral nor equicrural nor scalinon but all and none of these at once but it remained for m anatole france to extract the full delicious flavour of its humour according to the fallen angel nectaire in his discourse on the historical universal of bossuet there were only two schools of schoolmen one camp argued that before there were apples there was apple before there were parrots there was parrot before there were lecherous and greedy monks there was the monk the glutton and lecher before there were feet and bottoms in this world the kick in the bottom resided eternally in the bosom of god the other camp replied that on the contrary the kick in the bottom only existed after having been duly given and received 
now the new realism certainly saves its universals from this ridiculous predicament there can be no question of a kick in the ribs dwelling to all eternity in the bosom of the absolute because for the new realist there is no absolute and no bosom the universal kick in the ribs is itself an absolute and of its dwelling nothing can be said but that it is not in consciousness and not in space or time and of universals out of their context nothing can be said but that they are realities but observe that the peculiar outsideness of their reality their independence of consciousness hangs even more on the realist theory of perception than his theory of perception hangs on it concepts that is to say have been brought into line with percepts like percepts they are realities over against consciousness on the theory consciousness is simply confronted with them and in their presence it ought to be able to do nothing but stare at them in constantaire and each constatation is a recognition so that in order to constater it has need of another universal confronted with which it can do no more than recognize and constater and so on in as beautiful and infinite regress as ever delighted the heart of mr bradley there is only one way in which to arrest that infinite regress at the start and make the universals do the logical work required of them and that is not to drag them down from their high place in heaven but to recognize that their heaven the eternal kingdom of these blessed ones is within that they are as idealism should have always held them to be the work of thought they are none the less august and none the less real on that account it is thought that is exalted and not they that are abased the new realism has revived a realism very old older than scholasticism it will have none of aristotle's development of the platonic philosophy it refuses to admit that when aristotle objected that the a d were aesthita aedia eternalized sense data he was playing plato's game for him it will not see that when he said ideas are not idle they have hands and feet he was again playing plato's game and playing it better getting a move on to the ideas so as to make them do the twofold work required of them the work of logic and reality and consider what happened later after scholastic realism nominalism the inevitable reaction after nominalism conceptualism the forerunner of modern idealism it is just possible that history may repeat itself and that after the new realism of the twentieth century but i am reminded that our realism is in a very different case it is so securely based on a mathematical discovery unknown to aristotle unknown to the scholastics unknown to the idealists of the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries that it defies avenging time it follows or should follow in one unbroken logical sequence from cantor's discovery of the behaviour of the infinite through the desired proof of the continuity of space and time resolving their antinomies it is thus linked up with the physical sciences it has continued to do what vitalism vainly attempted faire tomber l'insurmontable barrière and rejoindre la science les joindre la science to join hands with science physical science that has always looked askance at it that will have none of its thinness that between its idealisms has always been philosophy's passion and its dream the passion and the dream which have produced materialism and agnosticism psychophysical parallelism and the naif empiricisms and realisms you would suppose then that the space and time it receives from the mathematician purged of all the contradictions and dilemmas of discreteness would have something in common with the space in which extension occurs and the time in which things happen for the truth of realism hangs in the last resort on the mathematical solution of the contradictions and dilemmas of space and time realists are never tired of reminding us that we have now got a continuous space and time to work with and that idealists cannot any longer insist on the impossibility of the passage from point to point and from instant to instant for as we have seen in infinite space there are no next points and in infinite time there are no next instants and consequently no gaps from an infinite series any number of members can be taken and to an infinite series any number can be added without either diminishing or increasing it 
does it not follow then that a finite series is not in any sense part of an infinite series this is a question for mathematicians and for all i know it may be either so obvious or so irrelevant that no mathematician would dream of asking it therefore i suggest it with the utmost diffidence and some misgiving it does seem to me to follow not only from cantor's law but from the definition of part and whole combined with the axiom that there are no infinite wholes from the impossibility of arguing from finite to infinite from the realist's assumption of the absoluteness of space and time and the plurality of absolute spaces and of times and from the atomistic theory of the intransigent and mutually repellent character of absolute entities and if it follows the bearings on our problem would be very relevant indeed for consider pure space and pure time are continuous in the sense that between any two points and any two instants there is an infinite number of points and of instants nor is there any other sense in which they could be continuous so that in an infinite series there are no two consecutive points or instants now between any two points is surely just as much a relation of finites as is the relation of two consecutive points and as such it has no business in an infinite series so that you cannot speak of an infinite number occurring between any two points and from this it would seem to follow that an infinite series is not a series at all and that there can be no infinite order of any sort yet though a point has no magnitude it has or should have position but how can it have position in a series or any other order that isn't a series or any other order where that is to say there are no positions that do not presuppose the space they are said to constitute so that we are back again in the dilemma of the infinite regress if you say that the point that has position is the euclidean point and that the points in question do not have positions but that they are positions i do not see that that helps you out of the difficulty for if points cannot have positions where there are no positions to have neither can they be positions where positions cannot be the contradiction is simply shifted from the discrete or consecutive continuity to the pointless point or positionless position again a point on any definition has no magnitude therefore it is indivisible therefore between any two points or any two instants will mean between any two indivisibles and between any two indivisibles there must be some hiatus which perhaps we cannot call spatial or temporal since space and time are continuous but which must surely be held to exist so that in space composed of an infinite number of points there must be an infinite number of non-spatial gaps and the same will hold good of time and if this isn't discreteness i do not know what is it is also by the axiom continuity it must be so if these points and these instants are neither to overlap or coalesce or otherwise behave like magnitudes and again any two indivisibles thus separated will be finite so that in the infinite two fine and flourishing contradictions have broken out making six in all one the contradiction of the infinite regress two the contradiction of the non-serial series three the contradiction of the positionless position four the contradiction of the non-spatial spaces and non-temporal times already considered five the contradiction of discrete continuity and six the contradiction of the finite infinite contradictions which are only to be avoided by dilemmas lastly on this system perception of the world of becoming is an act of reporting divisible into an infinite series of reports corresponding to the infinite series of moments constituting the process of change each atom in the moving show of becoming is an absolute entity reported as such it follows there can be no justifiable anticipation of events no reason why of the connections and sequences reported one should obtain rather than another i have not seen any refutation of mr bertrand russell's mathematical metaphysics and i can only dimly imagine the lines it would be likely to take but i think my idealistic monist with his back against the wall might put up some such defence as this if my monist is right he is better furnished with dilemmas now than ever he was under his own ontological scheme for if motion was a contradiction on the old theory of the infinitely discrete 
rest is a contradiction on the new theory of the continuous infinite for with this sort of continuity you can indeed go on but you can never never stop positionless position affords no rest for either achilles or the tortoise and with discrete continuity there can be neither motion nor rest what could an idealistic monist wish for more and when it comes to finite space his hope does not fail him what about the mile-long line that contains no more points than the inch-long line the thousandth part of the inch-long line that contains no fewer points than a thousand mile-long line both indeed containing an infinite number it looks as if the finite contained infinity but no that would be too good to be true the monist does not really want that seventh contradiction his cup is already fairly running over now it may be said that even supposing these contradictions and dilemmas were genuine and not solvable by cantor's law non-mathematical monists have no right to assume that they cannot be solved by mathematics in some way probably by calculations involving the fourth dimension but as the new mathematical logic does not stop at four but provides an infinite number of dimensions the monist may not unreasonably hope to reap a second crop of contradictions and dilemmas from these for the series of the dimensions is apparently obtained by every term in the series of one dimension itself giving birth to a series every term of which again gives birth to another series and so on for ever and ever a new dimension being generated with each series but the whole process of generation has its rise in the series of one dimension in which my monist was supposed to find his six fine contradictions each series therefore will bear within it some taint of the original infection and in any case if no finite number of points is any part of an infinite series of points mathematical logic itself apparently gives him the right to stick to it that no finite number of dimensions as might be three can be any part of an infinite series or order or arrangement or collection of dimensions so that three-dimensional space will be no part of infinitely dimensional space thus from the very start he can catch sight of his contradictions of the non-serial series the non-ordered order the non-collective collection with the dilemma of the finite infinite and on the far horizon of dilemmas on all fours with his positionless positions the non-dimensional dimension but suppose my monist does not reap his second crop of contradictions or his first crop either suppose he really has no business to insist that between any two points in any series is a relation of finites suppose there are grave mathematical reasons as for all i know there very well may be why between any two points in an infinite series is to be held contrary to all apparent reason as a relation of infinites without begging the question of the series and its infinity suppose there is no mathematical sense in which the discreteness he discovers is to be thought of and that his harvest fails in consequence is he therefore obliged to abjure his monism and his idealism remember the unique raison d'etre of his strange passion for contradictions and dilemmas he does not wallow in contradiction for contradiction's sake out of sheer perversity he desires that the contradiction may be solved therefore he flies to his infinite and absolute in spite of hegel and mr bradley he must have wondered how in the world it was going to perform its conjuring trick well if the higher mathematics really do all that they are said to do they will have shown him how das unbeschreibliche hier es getan they may pile universe on universe and multiply infinities by infinity on their own showing an impossible operation he will hold to his monism maintaining as i think he has every right to maintain that these purely mathematical operations have every mark and sign of ideality of being the work of thought of some sort of a god who geometrizes eternally if the constructions are infinite in number from the sheer monotony of the mathematical obsession he gathers that their constructor their builder and maker is one when pragmatists have twitted him with the thinness and poorness of his ultimate principle he may have wondered how thought could be infinite and absolute now it has been proved to him that it is so if challenged to show how the foundations of a material universe can be immaterial he has only to refer his opponent to mr bertrand russell's principia mathematica 
above all he profits by the realist's happy thought of rehabilitating universals for these primordial entities whose serious and indubitable reality mathematical logic compels him to believe in on whose reality the material universe depends are immaterial he has only got to fetch them in from outside to prove that the unseen reality of every mortal and material thing is immaterial and immortal having its habitation out of space out of time not out of thought for its presence there is the ground of all thinking the reason why things are recognized and known really universals are a priceless whole for the idealist for they justify his distinction between appearance and reality if realists will revive plato they must abide by the consequences of his resurrection and when you have said that they are spaceless and timeless formless and immaterial they remain delightfully undefined and undefinable the least that can be said of them is that they are immaterial the most that can be said of them is that they endure for the new realism after criticizing aristotle so severely for his handling of plato condescends to adopt his emendation of the doctrine of the ideas it very properly refuses to see in them eternalized duplicates patterns of the things of sense or any common property shared by things everything every quality and relation has its own universal and there are universals of unique and solitary things when clearly there can be none to share for the new realism white things do not partake of whiteness the relation is not and cannot be that of whole and part nor yet of possession as plato maintained whiteness is not white it is not the whiteness of white things it is the whiteness the universal ados of the whites now realism does well in thus improving on the platonic doctrine of ideas you might suppose from the important distinction that it makes that it regards the relation as something incomparably more subtle more intimate and more strong but as a matter of fact it does nothing of the kind it makes the distinction not that it may establish intimate relations which would argue a secret unity but that it may put asunder the reality of whiteness from the reality of white and bring pluralistic atomism into the world of the universals i think that in this it has defeated the ends of logic which are after all its own ends its failure is the monist's opportunity end of chapter six part three section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter six part three section three of a defence of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter six the new realism part three section three the conception of that sacred communion in which Isthita partook of id was plato's solution of the everlasting problem it was an attempt to escape from his own dualism the logical consequences of which he saw clearly the new realism in resuscitating plato makes everything of his dualism and nothing of his escape its interpretation of plato is peculiar it takes from plato what suits its pluralism and everything that will not fit into the programme it dismisses as a poet's fancy or the agreeable jest of a literary diner out surely plato's desperate attempt to round up all the ideas in the one supreme idea of the good might have served as a reminder that it is easier to interpret him than to appreciate his drift an atomistic logic has prepared the ground for the first idealist who comes along and resuscitates the absolute its really great discovery that there is necessarily a universe of unique and solitary cases turns against atomism from the moment that the idealist lays his hands on it and converts it to his own use for by no logic can you get over the fact that things in this universe of ours have relations and that relations relate if particulars are related so are universals their atoms cannot be kept apart they gather together to form logical molecules which form bodies which form worlds which form the universe of thought 
because thought can analyze this universe into atoms again it does not follow that its universe is not one the fact that your logical atoms are free to enter many combinations is no disproof of their ideal or spiritual unity you may be pleased to ignore the incurable tendency of atoms to form a universe but you do not destroy unity by calling it a collection though apparently you thus make atomistic logic an easier game to play but only apparently for when you insist as realism insists on taking the spectacular view of universals by divorcing their reality from the reality of thought you have made it impossible to use them in your thinking with any spectacular effect and when you do use them it is as logical counters which have every appearance of being inside conventions rather than outside realities and it will not only be their absoluteness and separateness that lands you in this impossibility of thinking you might indeed get over that difficulty by saying that you do not think you only look on at a spectacular process of thinking and there every idealist who is not a solipsist would agree with you but what in heaven's name are realities defined as independent of any and every thought of any and every consciousness doing in a process of thinking which is nothing if not conscious what sort of spectacle will universals treated as independent realities provide not only is whiteness not white and a universal kick in the ribs not a kick in the ribs but they have no content and no more conceivable relation not even the relation of likeness to white or to a kick in the ribs than they have to consciousness the new realism has provided another contradiction for the idealist to rejoice in the unconceived and unconceivable concept and yet another for there is a universal both of every actual proposition and of every possible proposition and the number of propositions is infinite for there is a universal of everything that exists and has existed and will exist and of everything that is and was and will be from the infinite number of physical atoms to the infinite number of numbers and of mathematical points and instants and about every one of these a true proposition may be made and for every true proposition made or unmade there is a false proposition that denies its truth therefore there will be an infinite number of false propositions denying the existence or the being of these things it is also an axiom that from even one false proposition an infinity of consequences will follow and for every one of these consequences there is also a universal therefore there will be an infinitely infinite number of universals standing for an infinitely infinite number of lies all equally exalted to the high and holy estate of reality all in fact horribly real ineradically planted out since on the theory as concepts they are whether any irrelevant person comes along to make the propositions or not all much more assured of immortality than any person so that the realist pluralistic universe is thick with the infinitely infinite numbers of the non-existent even allowing for the necessary distinction between being and existence i do not see how reality can be claimed for these objects of conception if reality has any meaning yet real they are since they endure in utter indifference as to whether there will ever be a conceiver to conceive them the realist can't say somebody's telling a lie he can only say there's a lie somebody's looking at it and the idealist may add to his collection of contradictions this infinity of unreal realities which is worth all his other harvests put together contradictions are fatal to the realist who prides himself on not having any but as we have seen they are meat and drink to the idealist who does not exalt them to the position of realities he has no use for the things of sense eternalized but he can take over the whole show of universals in a bunch purified from all taint of the particular and the finite he can treat them as the mysterious entities he needs to build up his universe like so many absolutes they are definable only by negation they are not definable ontologically by their logical functions they make known but they themselves have no content by which they are known they are not knowers they are not in any sense selves yet through their logical function they serve as carriers 
of the invisible and impalpable secret of selfhood all this is exceedingly important for idealistic monism the monist must have had moments of awful insight when he realized that the relation of whole and part was not quite equal to the strain he was putting on it he must have been aware that a contradiction and a dilemma here would wreck him but he has not got to stand or fall by that incompetent relation now that realism has restored universals to their ancient place and power they have solved for him what must if he had finished his thinking have become a dilemma that would have finished him for if he is honest he must have asked himself how a logical function can at the same time be an objective reality now he knows from the relation of the whole and part it was not quite possible for him to prove that things to be known perfectly must be known as they are in the absolute but he has only got to read his three fat volumes of the hegelian logic again in the light of the logic of mr bertrand russell to find his proof staring him in the face to be sure the logic of hegel has a thickness you could cut with a knife and beside it the logic of mr russell has the consistency of fine dust or of a thin gruel but no matter he can make out for himself that universals are the absolute reality of things they if anything is are things as they are in the absolute we do not know them we only know their appearances yet it is through them that the things we do know are known the idealist has now got most of the things he wanted if his mathematics are right he has found seven contradictions in his opponent's theory making nine in all if they are wrong he has got two fairly crucial ones in any case his appearance and his ultimate reality are as secure as they were before the new realists attacked them he has got them tight white is the appearance of whiteness and whiteness is the ultimate reality of white and he has got what he never could be quite sure of before their relation and if he has not got all the unity and multiplicity he wanted he has enough to satisfy any reasonable monist a universal is most undeniably one in many and its appearances are undeniably many in one it is true that analytic logic rules out all hope of ascension to a higher universal on pain of the contradiction of the one subject predicate combination it is true that there can be no rounding up of an infinite number of realities in one ultimate reality on the lines it lays down and that ultimate reality is for it a contradiction in terms or rather every reality is immediate and ultimate this is where the ways of pluralism and of monism part but i think that it is here that the monist scores with his theory of universals and his theory of appearance and reality for you can conceivably round up an infinite number of appearances in one reality if your one reality is the one and only absolute and if as he maintains universals are not realities outside absolute spirit but owe their reality to the very fact that they are in it that they are spiritual there need be no infinite number of them that is to say no infinite progress that removes his highest universal for ever from his grasp his highest universal will be spirituality he can now maintain without any contradiction that spirit is all things and that all things are spirit you cannot floor him with his own distinction between appearances and reality there is appearance and there is reality but if the spiritual universal truly is the reality of appearances if there is no other reality but spirit the appearances cannot assert an independent unspiritual reality of their own over against that universal appearances and reality are not mutually exclusive opposites they are correlatives and the distinction between them falls inside the spirituality that includes them both so that there will be no contradiction in the statement that reality is its own appearance and that appearances are reality but the realist who denies the unity must also deny the distinction since he maintains that reality appears as it is whereas the monist not only does not deny the distinction but has every interest in affirming it and he merely says that appearances are reality as it appears and that reality does not appear as it is the new realist like m bergson aspire to join hands with science they should remember their ambition when they charge the idealist with arrogance 
it is not he but they who overstep the modesty of science what they call realities science and idealism have agreed to call phenomena nobody accuses science of reducing its universe to one vast spectral hallucination or infinity of hallucinations appearances have this much of hallucination about them that they exist but they do not subsist to say this is not to deny the power and the glory of existence it was suggested in the beginning of this essay that if the idealistic monist would only walk humbly and acknowledge and renounce his errors all might yet be well with him hope was even held out that if he would only face the new realism fairly and squarely without any absurd depreciation of its strength by surrendering certain positions he might still hold others better worth keeping i have supposed him to have put up his defence i have even imagined him advancing on the enemy's positions i might have made him show a more furious impetus in attack but not i think a greater discretion in retirement it is quite clear what idealistic monism must surrender if it is to hold its own in philosophy it must give up its narrow philosophy of thought it must give up looking for unities and identities and ultimate realities where they are not it must give up its faith in the incompetent relation of the whole and part it must admit that metaphysical logic is in need of reform and it must admit that mr bertrand russell has reformed it it must admit the existence of a pluralistic universe it must admit that as far as human consciousness is concerned this universe is very largely spectacular but it need not accept the pluriverse that realism is thrust upon it above all it must not say that its righteous suppositions are ontological certainties if it observes these precautions it can hardly lay itself open to the charge of arrogance all philosophers are a little arrogant but which is the more arrogant the one who says either dogmatically or critically this is a spectacular universe but the spectators do not count and there is no reality behind the scene or the one who says this universe appears to be largely spectacular therefore it would be rather odd if there were not a reality behind it if he goes beyond this modest speculation it is because he finds himself intimately and mysteriously mixed up with the spectacle like one of mr russell's ultimates in a peculiar and undefinable relation he is in fact part of it he finds an immaterial reality forever behind precisely that portion of the spectacle that he constitutes as if a rent had been torn in the scene just there he is not considered arrogant or rash when he concludes that untold millions of spectators also mixed up with the spectacle intimately and mysteriously in a peculiar and undefinable relation constitute likewise so many spots as it were of immaterial reality discerned behind the scene he finds that these spectators are mixed up with each other in an intimacy and a mystery more peculiar still is he then so very rash or so very arrogant if he concludes that the immaterial realities discerned through these untold millions of rents are spots of one immaterial reality that is continuous behind the scene end of chapter six recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter seven part one section one of a defence of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter seven the new mysticism part one section one there are certainties and certainties there is the blessed certainty that two and two make four there is the still more blessed certainty that if x is greater than y and y is greater than z then x is greater than z there is the certainty that the sun will rise tomorrow so far as this last certainty is based on repeated experiences of sunrises it is not a certainty at all all you can say is that what has happened a thousand million times will happen again if there is the same reason for its happening if that is to say the cause or causes of its happening continue to work which again can only happen so long as the conditions of their working hold good 
causation applied to sequences is a pure hypothesis and an hypothesis that will not work and mere sequences provide no grounds for assuming causes still fenced round with conditions the certainty that the sun will rise to-morrow is a reasonable certainty it cannot be said that at the end of our metaphysical quest we have reached any such certainty as this we have not even established our contention that all metaphysical quests seek the same end pluralism gives the lie to our complacent assurance that their goal is unity still we made out that all with the one exception of pluralism are out for unity of some kind if it be only the unity of utter negation and pluralism in declaring that immediate reality is ultimate enough for it is out for ultimate reality it even pays its tribute to the absolute in regarding all its realities as absolute unity then or ultimate reality or both are the objects of the metaphysical quest and in the contest between the sticklers for the one and the sticklers for the many we found that spiritual monism has reason on its side only if it lowers its claim to something less than certainty the spiritual monist plays high and he stands to lose more if he should lose but he is still within the rigour of the game but outside these certainties outside the rigour of the game and outside the paths where reason leads so cautiously there is a region of so-called certainties which we have not yet explored it would be easy to say of these certainties that they are true for those for whom they are true but that the claimants are all agreed both about their truth and about the way by which it is to be found and but that the object of their quest is the object of the metaphysical quest ultimate reality they are so unanimous that divided as they are by centuries and continents there is less distance between a christian mystic of the thirteenth century and a buddhist mystic of the present day than there is say between mr bertrand russell and mr gilbert chesterton they are the real plungers they stake their lives upon the game and their souls upon the end of the adventure though they are many they go alone on a dubious and dangerous way to the quiet place the untravelled country the city of god the sorrowless land the region of their certainty is not a region where the laws of mathematics and the laws of nature and the laws of thought are suspended where two and two do not make four but something else and where miracles happen miracles are not by any means an essential part of the mystic's game still he can give no rational account of his procedure reason does not reject him more than he rejects reason in the wrong place in the place where his adventure happened two and two do not exist and their behaviour is irrelevant but if it comes to that there is no reason why two and two should make four they simply make it there is no reason why the mystic should perceive ultimate reality he simply perceives it extremes meet the pluralist perception of ultimate reality is immediate so is the mystics but if the mystic is right the pluralist reality is not ultimate now it cannot be denied that mysticism is suspect it has a bad history in fact it has two histories an ancient and a modern history and it would be hard to say which of them is the worse mysticism goes back to the most primitive of primitive times it is part of our ancestral heritage of our submerged and savage past this past is the skeleton in the monist cupboard for monism itself is involved in this ancient history that is why healthy pluralists and healthy pragmatists will have none of it they abhor the taint the monist is always suspected of some mystical party pre he is like a man with a history of drink in his family he cannot escape the damaging imputation yet it by no means follows because every mystic is a monist that every monist is a mystic it does not follow because the mystic gets at his ultimate reality by way of passion and vision that the monist is implicated in his orgies and hallucinations at this rate mr bertrand russell's principia mathematica should be gravely compromised by the ancient history of sacred numbers but let us say that monism is the lineal descendant of mysticism or that the two are collaterals and have the same ancestry if mysticism has had an ancient history it must have been evolved it must have become what it once was not 
it cannot now be what it once was all the same the stages of its evolution must be linked together by one and the same thread that thread is the same thread that we found in tracing the evolution of the psyche it is the will to live the desire to have life and to have it more abundantly as the psyche grows this desire grows with it or rather it would seem to be the very mainspring of its growth anyhow it grows it grows into a consuming passion it passes beyond physical bounds and the love of life becomes the love of god the primitive and savage form of it is the desire for fertility the desire to live and to make live primitive and savage magic the humble origin of mysticism with which it is reproached is fertility magic the earliest rites the rites de passage the rites of tribal initiation of adolescence of marriage the funeral rites of death itself have one and the same object to bring life to ensure the virility of the tribesmen the ghosts of the dead must be appeased with sacrifices that they may bring fertility to the earth for ghosts miss jane harrison is my authority were conceived first of all as underground things as germs from the grave the very earliest greek vase paintings show them as diminutive psyches or winged keres fluttering in a grave jar the savage placates the ghosts of his forefathers first of all that he may obtain their strength their mana he drinks the blood of human sacrifices or of the sacrificial animal that he may get their life later on he divines a god in the dead hero and in the form of the sacrificial animal in partaking of the flesh and blood of the animal he gets the life of the god so far we seem to have hardly advanced a step beyond savagery but presently magic becomes mystery the initiate aspires to union with the god union first of all for the sake of fertility the lesser mysteries seem to have had frankly no other aim it is in the greater mysteries of eleusis in the sacred marriage and the sacred birth that the conception of fertility broadens and deepens and that the life-force appears as the stupendous and the divine thing it is it does not matter whether the sacred marriage was an actual physical union between priest and priestess hierophant and initiate or whether as miss jane harrison assures us it was an entirely spiritual and symbolic rite or whether again it was originally actual and physical and became spiritual and symbolic afterwards or whether it was originally spiritual and was afterwards debased miss harrison seems to me to have proved her case the sacred marriage that began there can be little doubt as a fertility rite ends in the adoration of life itself and becomes itself a rite de passage from the lesser mystery of the body to the greater mysteries of the soul and by the time the orphics have taken the thing in hand there is no doubt as to what has happened and is happening the last and greatest initiation is accomplished the dangerous passage from the physical to the spiritual life has been made no matter if the orphic mystic covered himself from head to foot with white clay like his descendant the pierrot and like his ancestor the savage white clay man of tribal rites of adolescence his whiteness is now symbolic of the new life it does not matter whether the orphic always was or was not the utterly spiritual person his whiteness proclaimed him to be the spiritual life now appears as the object of desire and ambition and desire and ambition we have seen to be always in advance of actual achievement when magic becomes mystery we are on the threshold of ultimate reality henceforth there is no doubt as to the meaning of the words new birth and union with god now it is possible to read into the orphic mysteries more of plato than they will bear but this much seems certain that before plato's time the sense of life had widened so far as to make way for platonism for neoplatonism and for christianity and the sense of life becomes more and more the sense of the unseen the love of god becomes more and more the passion for the absolute i am quite willing to give up neoplatonism to anybody who wants to go for it on the grounds that it carried the passion for godhead to drunken excess neoplatonic mysticism is a psychological phenomenon like any other it was the phenomenon you might expect when east and west were violently flung together in the great melting-pot of alexandria 
what i want to point out is that at the very finest period of greek civilization philosophy was turning from the doctrines of the many from the doctrine of the flux and from the doctrine of atomism from the pragmatic humanism of the sophists to the doctrine of the one and that the distinction was then made between appearance and reality and that the passion for god and the metaphysical quest of the absolute ran together or rather the metaphysical hunt was foremost thought led and passion did its best to follow those people who will have it that monism is the offshoot of mysticism a disease of thought reverting to a savage ancestry should really read their plato all over again and aristotle on the top of him and plotinus and philo and porphyry on the top of aristotle when it may become clear to them that mysticism owes more to philosophy than philosophy could ever owe to it plato gives a point now and then to pluralistic realism but if they are going to stretch that point and insist that plato was a pluralist and that aristotle the detestable aristotle was the accursed thing all the better they will have some difficulty in bringing home a charge of mysticism against him i would also suggest that the primitive savage had no monistic prejudices the more ghosts bestowed on him their mana the more sacrificial animals gave him their life to drink the more everything all round him increased and multiplied the better he was pleased you cannot get away from it the quest of ultimate reality is as much a necessity of thought as it is a passion of the soul and the idea of the absolute is not primitive it is a very late and highly sublimated idea because greek art has preserved for us the earliest origins of greek religion and because greek literature and greek philosophy are still alive among us at this day thank heaven we are able to trace the stages of this development and the links of these connections but if you will read those sacred books of the east which the robust the almost too emphatically robust pragmatist regards as so much benger's food for sick souls because he has lost his mature and healthy appetite for unity if you will read the vedas and the upanishads and the commentaries of the vedanta and the buddhist suttas and the texts of taoism you will find the same development and the same connections here again thought leads and the passion for the absolute follows until thought overthrows the thinker and thought and passion and the desire of life are consumed or consummated in nirvana or in the emptiness and nothingness of the great tao but the old testament gives you pause the links between primitive fertility magic and mysticism between tribal initiation rites de passage sacrificial ritual and redemption between the desire for physical life and the desire for spiritual life are as apparent as you would expect them to be but the lead of thought the metaphysical flair is entirely wanting the hebrews thirst for god was a consuming thirst but the philoprogenitive jew thought of god as the creator the father he never rose to the metaphysical conception of the absolute to the very last jehovah preserved some of the old ways of the tribal deity he was a struggling and a battling god full of mercy when he got his own way and of vengeance when he didn't in his milder moods he was very like the pragmatic god of humanism the first jew who developed a passion for the absolute was cursed by his people and driven out of their synagogues and if baruch spinoza had lived in the first century instead of the seventeenth they would have crucified him still though the god of the prophets is not and never can be the absolute he is one religion that begins in the fear of the supernatural and ends in the consuming love of it is the historic witness to the passion for unity polytheism which might be supposed to prove the contrary is a case in point ancestor worship which seems to have been at the bottom of the whole business fathers being fertile gives way to hero worship when the pantheon is inconveniently crowded the merging of the gods takes place the gods make a fine show of multiplicity when they are all gathered together in one heaven but apparently there is none of them that did not start as a more or less single tribal or local hero the most ancient of all the underground gods of fertility and life in death were so indeterminate in person and so universal in power and function as to count as one when the gods multiply by migration of local heroes their mysterious godhead diminishes with their multiplicity until ultimately they are gathered up again into one 
one jehovah one zeus and practically one ormuzd one mithra one shang ti and where ancestor worship has persisted one mikado on any theory with a pluralistic bias it is remarkable to say the least of it that where polytheism is most rampant as in india the reaction to pantheism and to mysticism has been strongest and that in japan where ancestor worship has persisted into civilized times the great refuge is buddhism does it not look as if the inappeasable passion was and is this longing to escape from multiplicity and from the importunity of ancestors this refusal to have the eternal spaces bewilderingly thronged the same uneasiness is at the root of the craving for the mystic union with god and it is fiercest in a religion like christianity which is based on a metaphysical and moral dualism antagonism between soul and body and separation between god and man it tries in vain to bridge the gulf with its makeshift doctrine of incarnation and atonement it would be absurd to say that christian asceticism was worse than any other but none has been more unclean and more profane in its repudiation of the earth christianity took to itself the ritual of the world it conquered but it refused the one thing in that ritual which was necessary to its own salvation the simple sacramental attitude to life in spite of its beautiful doctrine of love and mercy and pity it was instinct with the spirit's cruelty to the flesh and it is precisely this atonement manque this failure of a spiritual religion to be spiritual enough that is at the root of half the evil and the sickness and the suffering of the modern world a religion spiritual enough to have made a genuine atonement between god and man would have conquered not europe and america only but the whole world but if such an ideal can be conceived without a metaphysic it could not be born from the ruins of paganism and of a roman empire and from the conquests of half-savage goths and visigoths it was the secret thing conceived in the soul of christ that has its dwelling in the prophetic need and in the dreams and in the heart of man but it is still waiting to be born that other profoundly unchristian christianity is important for our assumption for it is the unique source of the moral argument which is the most serious objection the pragmatic humanist has brought against the monist by a peculiar irony that argument bears hardest upon dualism's own god the absconding deity of historic and popular christianity and we have seen that there is no solution of his moral problem that does not land the humanist in monism again and by yet another irony the christian dogma of the atonement is the most powerful indictment of the absentee almighty and an implicit confession that the god of pantheism is our only refuge monism i think has shown itself to be imperishable under some form or other and to be about as much tainted with primitive savagery as say the higher mathematics but what about mysticism mysticism may be no more tied to its ancient history than any other of our instincts and aptitudes but it does betray a shocking tendency to revert at least western mysticism has betrayed that tendency and its modern history is every bit as bad as its past i know that one of the most distinguished authorities on western mysticism evelyn underhill has assured us that this is not so that though magic and mysticism have a common traffic in the supernatural their interests and their object are essentially different the fundamental difference between the two is this he says magic wants to get mysticism wants to give we may class broadly as magical all forms of self-seeking transcendentalism the object of the thing is always the same the deliberate exaltation of the will till it transcends its usual limitations and obtains for the self or groups of selves something which it or they did not previously possess it is an individualistic and acquisitive science End quote. this is no doubt true in a sense it is also true that the object of mysticism is to get something and that all its giving is a means to getting the mystic wants to get illumination to get peace to get deliverance to feed on life and drink life to eat his flesh and drink his blood to get spiritual sustenance the mana of the god the parallel is very close indeed but there is this prodigious difference primitive man desires to get by magic physical things that without it would come to him of their own accord in due season only he does not yet know that the mystic desires to get spiritual things 
and still the parallel holds so far that both are ensuring against possible failure and between these two regions of desire and expectation there is a dubious borderland the region of the so-called supernatural powers of which the mystic himself cannot say whether they are magical or spiritual the power of healing of vision of clairvoyance and clairaudience of control over matter this is the region where miracles are said to happen though neither the believer in magic nor the mystic know what is really happening it whatever it is happens in the east and west wherever magic and mysticism are known and practised the taoist the perfect man says kuang tzu is spirit-like great lakes might be boiling about him and he would not feel their heat the ho and the han might be frozen up and he would not feel the cold he mounts on the clouds of the air and rides on the sun and moon and rambles at ease beyond the four seas if says the buddhist sutta a bhikkhu should desire to exercise one by one each of the different mystical powers being one to become multiform being multiform to become one to become visible or to become invisible to go without being stopped to the further side of a wall or a fence or a mountain as if through air to penetrate up and down through solid ground as if through water to walk on the water without dividing it as if on solid ground to travel cross-legged through the sky like the birds on wing to touch and feel with the hand even the sun and moon mighty and powerful though they be and to reach in the body even up to the heaven of brahma to hear with clear and heavenly ear surpassing that of men sounds both human and celestial whether far or near there is nothing to prevent him he has only got to fulfil all righteousness to be devoted to that quietude of heart which springs from within and not to drive back the ecstasy of contemplation he must look through things he must be much alone anybody with the smallest knowledge of abnormal psychology will see that this is the region of telepathy and of suggestion and auto-suggestion and of psychic phenomena generally and nobody with the slightest intellectual caution will deny that it is a region of the utmost uncertainty and danger end of chapter seven part one section one recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter seven part one section two of a defence of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter seven the new mysticism part one section two now there is not one of the mystics claims that is not under serious consideration at the present day they cannot be settled with and dismissed at sight as palpable absurdities the things he calls spiritual and the things other people call psychic are too closely platted together to be easily disentangled what is more the belief in the supernatural even magic itself have never died out of human history mysticism itself in some form or other has never died all the philosophy and all the science of the nineteenth century have been powerless against it so far from being near its death in this century it seems to be approaching a rather serious revival the modern psychologist and the psychoanalyst will tell you that there is nothing mysterious about this indestructibility and persistence mysticism is as indestructible as the human libido and as persistent as human folly and its revival in the twentieth century is precisely what you might expect in an age in which neurosis is the prevailing malady the specialist in morbid psychology will tell you that the history of mysticism is a history of neurosis he will point not in undue triumph to the saints and mystics of the salpetriere he will assure you that the great saints and mystics are in no better case but that on the contrary the life of the religious recluse provides in a supreme degree all the conditions of the hysterical neurosis its repressions are the classical repressions its results the classical results he will ask you to consider dispassionately the awful record of ill health revealed in the lives of the saints and piling proof upon proof 
he will show you in their visions and fantasies a perfect correspondence with the visions and fantasies of the neurotic and the insane and the sting of his observations will be in their truth what is to be said of these utterances of st teresa herself she speaks of the great shocks i used to feel when our lord would throw me into these trances and again it is like a person who having a rope round his neck tries to breathe on other occasions the soul seems to be in the utmost extremity of need asking itself and saying where is thy god i saw myself dying with the desire to see god and i knew not how to seek that life otherwise than by dying certain great impetuosities of love though not so intolerable as those of which i have spoken before overwhelmed me this prayer is like the sobbing of little children who seem on the point of choking and whose disordered senses are soothed by giving them to drink some slight mitigations may be had and the pain may pass away for a little by praying god to relieve its sufferings but the soul sees no relief except in death by which it hopes to attain the fruition of its good at other times those impetuosities are so violent the soul can do neither this nor anything else the whole body is contracted and neither hand nor foot can be moved if the body be upright at the time it falls down as a thing that has no control over itself it cannot even breathe all it does is to moan not loudly because it cannot its moaning however comes from a keen sense of pain again an angel appears to her in a vision i saw in his hand a long spear of gold and at the iron's end there seemed to be a little fire he appeared to be thrusting it at times into my heart and to pierce my very entrails when he drew it out he seemed to draw them out also and to leave me all on fire with the great love of god of st catherine of genoa it is said that at times she would seem to have her mind in a mill and as if this mill were indeed grinding her soul and body she would at times when in the garden seize hold of the thorn-covered twigs of the rose-bushes with both her hands and would not feel any pain while thus doing it in a transport of mind she would also bite her hands and burn them and this in order to divert if possible her interior oppression st john of the cross speaks of an intense and amorous impetus answering to st teresa's impetuosities and what are we to make of his confession that the ecstasies of the soul's union with god are often so poignant that they interpenetrate the body itself so that it is awakened and partakes of the soul's passion after its own kind even lady julian of norwich that most exquisite and lovable of all mystics whose love of god was not greater than her love of her neighbour who saw that each kind compassion that man hath on his even christen it is christ in him even lady julian was tormented her beautiful soul was haunted by the most horrible visions the result of concentrated meditation on the passion i saw the bodily sight lasting of the plenteous bleeding of the head the great drops of blood fell down from under the garland like pellets seeming as it had come out of the veins and in the coming out they were brown red for the blood was full thick and in the spreading abroad they were bright red and when they came to the brows then they vanished notwithstanding the bleeding continued till many things were seen and understood the fairness and the lifelikeness is like nothing but the same the plenteousness is like to the drops of water that fall off the eaves after a great shower of rain that fall so thick that no man may number them with bodily wit and for the roundness they were like to the scale of herring in the spreading on the forehead these three came to my mind in the time pellets for roundness in the coming out of the blood the scale of the herring in the spreading in the forehead for roundness the drops off ease for the plenteousness innumerable this showing was quick and life-like and horrifying and dreadful sweet and lovely she has this vision of christ's thirst for this word was showed for the bodily thirst the which i understood was caused by failing of moisture for the blessed flesh and bones was left all alone without blood and moisture the blessed body dried alone long time with wringing of the nails and weight of the body 
for i understood that for tenderness of the sweet hands and of the sweet feet by the greatness hardness and grievousness of the nails the wounds waxed wide and the body sagged for weight by long time hanging and therewith was piercing and pressing of the head and binding of the crown all baked with dry blood with the sweet hair clinging and the dry flesh to the thorns and the thorns to the flesh drying and in the beginning while the flesh was fresh and bleeding the continual sitting of the thorns made the wounds wide and furthermore i saw that the sweet skin and the tender flesh with the hair and the blood was all raised and loosed about from the bone with the thorns wherethrough it were rent in many places as a cloth that were sagging as if it would hastily have fallen off for heaviness and looseness while it had natural moisture and that was great sorrow and dread to me for me thought i would not for my life have seen it fall how it was done i saw not but understood it was with the sharp thorns and the violent and grievous setting on of the garland of thorns unsparingly and without pity this continued a while and soon it began to change and i beheld and marvelled how it might be and then i saw it was because it began to dry and stint a part of the weight and set about the garland and thus it encircled all about as it were garland upon garland the garland of the thorns was dyed with the blood and that other garland of blood and the head all was one colour as clotted blood when it is dry the skin of the flesh that showed of the face and of the body was small rimpled with a tanned colour like a dry board when it is aged and the face more brown than the body but the freudian psychoanalyst would be specially interested in lady julian's vision of the fiend who visited her in her sleep i lay still till night trusting in his mercy and then i began to sleep and in the sleep at the beginning methought the fiend set him on my throat putting forth a visage full near my face like a young man's and it was long and wondrous lean i saw never none such the colour was red like the tilestone when it is new burnt with black spots therein like black freckles fouler than the tilestone his hair was red as rust clipped in front with full locks hanging on the temples he grinned on me with a malicious semblance showing white teeth and so much methought it the more horrible body nor hands had he none shapely but with his paws he held me in the throat and would have strangled me but he might not and i am afraid pathologists will not be inclined to accept lady julian's own interpretation of her vision of the child and the dead body and in this time she says i saw a body lying on the earth which body showed heavy and horrible without shape and form as it were a swollen quag of stinking mire and suddenly out of this body sprang a full fair creature a little child fully shapen in form nimble and lively whiter than lily which swiftly glided up into heaven and the swollenness of the body betokeneth great wretchedness of our deadly flesh and the littleness of the child betokeneth the cleanness of purity in the soul and methought with this body abideth no fairness of this child and on this child dwelleth no foulness of this body when you remember that these visions came to the mystic in her little anchoress's house in the graveyard of the church of st julian the wonder is not that they were so terrible but that they were not much worse and besides being morbid and unbalanced the mystics not lady julian but other mystics show a certain arrogance for all their humility and self-surrender they show arrogance the saint is exalted because she has won god's love because she is chosen above other women to be the spouse of christ the blessed angela of foligno declared that the lord had told her he loved her above any other woman in the valley of spoleto you seldom hear of the other spouses the other loves the attitude is entirely self-centred it would be interesting to know what saint teresa would have said to lady julian or saint catherine of siena to the blessed angela we do know what saint teresa thought of her own nuns when they had aspirations in her normal state the undaunted daughter of desires was one of the wisest and strongest minded of the saints second only to saint catherine of siena in wisdom and strong-mindedness and practical common sense she was suspicious of experiences 
especially of other people's experiences and she owns to a profound distrust of vision there is often no sign by which the soul can tell a vision sent by god from a vision sent by satan she recognizes that in this very region of fantasy and symbol there lie hidden the deepest pitfalls for the soul therefore whatever risk she herself was prepared to take she did not allow her nuns to seek these adventures passing on the discouragement she had received from her own spiritual directors spiritual jealousy the last infirmity of saints may have had something to do with these prohibitions but it is far more likely that they were meant as safeguards against the deadliest perils of the monastic life the spiritual directors were the psychoanalysts of their day and when a great mystic pleaded that his or her case was exceptional we can imagine them replying with all the finality of their science there are no exceptions and the modern psychoanalyst argues with every show of reason thus if in nine hundred and ninety-nine cases out of a thousand the same symbolic fantasy has been found to stand for the same thing how when the thousandth case presents that symbolic fantasy can we admit its plea to be regarded as an exception you say that it depends on the context and you are told ruthlessly that the context is the same there are no exceptions out of their own mouths the great mystics stand condemned so far from there being any way out and forwards in this direction it would seem that the mystic way is the surest way backwards and in for two reasons first because in the mystic longing and the mystic union sublimation is still imperfect the libido although it is transferred from a human and bodily object to a divine and spiritual one is not transformed it is simply carried over in a more or less unsublimated state secondly because the mystic look is essentially an inward one the mystic seeks god for the most part not in the outer world of art and science and action but in the darkest and most secret recesses of his own soul and it is precisely this darkness and secrecy that the psychoanalyst has the most reason to mistrust if anybody could persuade me that all was and is well with the mystics it would be miss evelyn underhill she does not blink the patent and indeed blatant fact of mystical ill-health if we see in the mystics as some have done the sporadic beginning of a power a higher consciousness towards which the race slowly tends then it seems likely enough that where it appears nerves and organs should suffer under a stress to which they have not yet become adapted and that a spirit more highly organized than its bodily home should be able to impose strange conditions on the flesh it is at least permissible to look on the strange psychological state common amongst the mystics as just such a rebellion on the part of a normal nervous and vascular system against the exigencies of a way of life to which it has not yet adjusted itself this is i think broadly and roughly true but it would be more closely and finely true to say that the mystic consciousness presents in a marked degree the pathological phenomena of dissociation m Genet's account of the matter in his etat mental de hysteriques leaves us in no doubt as to what is actually happening here he shows that the root of the neuroses and psychoses of all mental maladies in fact lies in dissociation the break between one idea or group of ideas and its normal context and logical connections the cutting off of one psychic state or group of states from the stream of consciousness itself this isolated and abandoned tract is the home of all the obsessions the fixed ideas the morbid complexes unearthed by the psychoanalysts the daydreams and fantasies of neurotic and insane persons it is the home of lapsed instincts and memories of things forgotten because of their dreadfulness or simply because of their uselessness it is our ancestral and racial territory the place of our forgotten and yet undying past of what has been conscious once and is no longer conscious portions of our present that we have no use for and that would only hamper us are continually going to join this forsaken past but if we are to keep the image of consciousness as a stream we had better say that they sink to the bottom and stay there until some eddy in the deep stirs them up again you can reverse the image if you like and think of consciousness as some city of the sea 
raised on land partly submerged partly reclaimed from the sea a sea that threatens perpetually to overflow the thresholds of its palaces but without bothering about territories and streams and bottoms and seas and thresholds the point to bear in mind is that all lapses and losses of a present memory or aptitude barring physical lesion or decay all perversions of instinct and desire all suppressions obsessions and possessions all cases of double or multiple personality are states primarily and essentially of dissociation and that detachment which is the one indispensable condition of mystical experience is primarily and essentially a state of dissociation and it is as mystics themselves are perfectly well aware a very dangerous state there is not one step of the mystic way from meditation through illumination introversion contemplation and quiet to deliverance and to ecstasy that is not a step further in the process of dissociation the mystic deliberately seeking ultimate reality has left normal consciousness behind him he has closed all the approaches in that direction and he has opened doors another image but i can't help it he has opened doors to anything that may be waiting for him below or beyond the threshold he is out or in for a dreadfully perilous adventure and what happens to him will depend on whether this region beyond normal consciousness is only the too well-trodden territory of the past or also the untrodden country of the future in the one case his mystical experience will be a sinking downwards or a turning backwards in the other it may be a rising upwards or a going on and there is a third alternative it may be both quite easily it may be both for we have now to do with a more or less divided and disintegrated personality i think that still keeping the saints and mystics of the salpetriere well in sight we shall find that there are some grounds for supposing that the country of abnormal consciousness stretches forwards as well as backwards and belongs every bit as much to our future as to our past our normal everyday present consciousness lies between what has been and what shall be it has been developed as we have seen by processes of forgetting that is to say of dissociation carried to perfection it exists as it is now by virtue of its defiance and its rupture with the past that it suppresses but is powerless to destroy so that if it is to advance at all beyond its normal state it can only do so by a process of detachment or dissociation by that letting go and forgetting of the actual by that renunciation and self-surrender that dying to live which is the secret of the mystic life let us suppose then that in his abnormal state the mystic has before him the entire range of the unconscious and subconscious that his psyche hovers between its old forgotten playground of the past and its unknown playground of the future it may be the prey and the victim of powers of instincts and of memories which once served its development and which have dropped from it by disuse or it may be the experimenter with undeveloped powers of which it is by no means the master at best it can only advance a little way a very little way along the path it is ultimately destined to travel but it can go back very easily down that well-trodden path by which it came it can go a short way or even a fairly long way and yet return but if it goes too far it is lost it is hopelessly estranged from itself and from the life of the normal living it is not to mince matters mad or it may go up and down on the two paths and its tendency to go up and down or to go downwards most of the time and seldom if ever to go upward all of the time or even for very long at any one time is recorded in the confessions of all the saints in the face of these confessions we might feel suspicious of our supposition but for two things we have personal experience of psychic dissociation every night when we dream and we have authentic evidence bearing on the existence of a fairly extensive borderland lying between magic and mysticism the region of the so-called psychic powers professor freud has said two notable things about dreams dreams are a piece of the conquered life of the childish soul and the dream is a disguised fulfilment of a repressed wish he might have said with equal truth 
dreams are a piece of the yet unconquered life of the soul that is to be or the dream is a fulfilment of the repressed desire to transcend our normal powers seeing that in our dream consciousness we do transcend them in every dream adventure we make experiments with the soul that is to be if dreaming were not the common and accustomed thing it is we should be astounded at our own performances every time we dream when people come down in the morning and tell you that they have had a very remarkable dream what they mean is that their dreams are more remarkable than other people's dreams but it does not occur to them how remarkable it is that anybody should have a dream at all it was no doubt a good thing for the race when it definitely made up its mind that we are dealing with realities when we wake and with unrealities when we dream but it is mainly owing to this really very rash assumption that an extraordinarily interesting and significant form of consciousness should have been left to the imaginative layman and the quack investigator until the psychoanalyst took it over i am not forgetting the admirable work done by the society for psychical research this has been mainly in collecting and sifting material for psychology to deal with but recent discussion has tended towards recognition of the dream's peculiar and profound reality dream experiences are not explained by calling them hallucinations nor yet when we have named their cause unconscious cerebration cerebration is always unconscious and it accompanies and perhaps in some way conditions waking consciousness too that there should be inside excitements and reverberations nerve cells and brain cells keeping up their activity on their own after the outside stimulus has ceased is not more remarkable than any other physical event but we should expect the psychic events that correspond with this activity to be the faded images the fainter reverberations of waking states to be as broken as confused and as fantastic as you please but still to obey the ordinary fundamental conditions of space and time so far as it accounts for anything unconscious cerebration might account for such a dream consciousness as this but not for the dream consciousness we know the unaccountable things are the conditions of the dream itself the dream space the dream time the dream unity of consciousness the dream itself no amount of unconscious cerebration can explain the facts that at one and the same time i am or seem to be several other persons besides myself while preserving my own identity in them that i can penetrate into walled spaces without opening doors that i can arrive at positions in space without occupying intermediate positions in space that i can go through a continuous series of performances involving an expenditure of time that may be anything between five hours and five days or with suitable breaks even five years all in what proves to have been three seconds by the watch at my bedside in my nerve and brain records there can be no memory of my ever having done these things and they cannot well be explained as compounds of fragments of the things i have done surely the obvious inference is that i do them not in the space of waking consciousness and not in three seconds of watch time but in another space and in another time and that in doing them i have been both the waking eye and another more marvellous eye and to some extent others for the waking eye remembers the dream experience though not always perfectly and the dream eye remembers parts at any rate of the waking experience that is to say while preserving selfhood it has transcended normal consciousness it is probable that racial consciousness is resurgent in the dreams even of normal people and that it plays an enormous part in the dreams of neurotics and of lunatics it is probable that in dreams the psyche goes backwards it is no less probable i think that urged by its half-conscious and wholly prophetic need it goes forwards too and grasps at and reaches powers that will ultimately be its normal conscious possession end of chapter seven part one section two Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 7, Part 1, Section 3 of A Defense of Idealism by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter seven the new mysticism part one section three and besides the dream powers there are the other powers of the borderland the psychic powers that belong to the world of mysticism and magic and the occult and are claimed equally by scoundrels and by saints until comparatively recent years they and the peculiar form of consciousness they involve were in the same case as the dream powers they were left to the quack practitioner and the amateur investigator most of us can remember the time when the existence of telepathy was not admitted by persons who had a scientific reputation to take care of and suggestion was on its trial as for faith healing palmistry clairvoyance clairaudience automatism mediumship and the rest they are still mixed up with such fraud and humbug and silliness and with persons so disgraceful so discredited so absurd that it is not easy to write about them in a work that is at any rate trying to be serious i feel to be disgustingly egoistic that any reputation i may have is already so imperilled by my devout adhesion to the absolute that i simply cannot afford to be suspected of tenderness or even toleration for the professors of the occult the society for psychical research may be trusted to deal appropriately with unorganized imposture but the organized variety is another matter and there are at least two organizations which seem to be beyond the power of any society or of any government or state to control them theosophy and christian science they are dangerous not because they have had an ancient history but because they have had and are having a modern one christian science is by far the more dangerous though not the less dubious of the two it is dangerous because of its successes it is dangerous because its best exponents are really sincere and truthful and profoundly spiritual persons but these are not always its most successful practitioners for when all is said and done and its misses and its failures are counted its gains make quite a considerable show its traffic in the world of appearances is indeed astounding also its profit seeing that it ignores the known methods of procedure and the proved facts and the ascertained sequences and connections of that world with a mouthful of phrases and formulas and a few ill-assorted bits of popular philosophy picked up haphazard with an utter ignorance of what it calls western science it is trying to undo in a day the work of centuries the elaborate and patient work of the most beneficent of all physical sciences and it is succeeding not long ago in a country village i came on an innocent family of four persons they were trying to get well there the father's and the mother's health was impaired and the two children's quite efficiently shattered by the effects of the scarlet fever they had had a year ago they had had it owing to the view their neighbour held that because christian science can cure nervous headaches and hysterical paralysis and take down inflammation it can cure scarlet fever too or at any rate can allow children displaying all the appearances of scarlet fever scarlet fever itself not being a reality to run loose about a city without damage to the public safety and the neighbour is probably of that opinion still and when his children get diphtheria they will probably be allowed to spread it abroad in the same way but though christian science despises appearances in the form of disease germs and the laws of nature it does not despise them in the form of dollars and of goods it is too much messed up with appearances altogether it does not discriminate it will not render unto appearance the things that are appearances and unto reality the things that are realities i find it hard to write fairly of theosophy possibly because i have suffered from theosophists i do not like their way of handling the sacred books of the east i object to having the bhagavad gita and the sutta of all the asavas thrown at my head as if they had been portions of scripture appointed for the day and specially applicable to my unspiritual case i hate it when a woman i disapprove of tells me that if i would only extinguish all my desires i should attain nirvana to-morrow i know it but i do not want to attain nirvana quite so soon 
when i am eating chicken and my host is eating lettuce i resent his telling me that a vegetarian cannot endure the presence of a flesh-eater but that he conceals his repulsion because he is holier than the flesh-eater and i am really frightened when i am introduced to a female adept who cannot walk through a churchyard without seeing what goes on in the graves and who insists on describing what she has seen surely there is something very wrong there now there are theosophical societies like the quest society that are innocent and there are theosophists like mr a p sinnett and mr g r s mead who command the greatest admiration and respect but i would rather think of mr sinnett and mr mead as scholars and experts in strange religions than as theosophists at all if i had to choose between pragmatism and theosophy i would without hesitation choose pragmatism but that there are powers some powers is i think no longer in dispute i am quite sure that but for my will not to be healed a christian scientist could heal me if i offered the appropriate disorder i dare say the powers of mr ledbetter and mrs annie besant or their mahatmas could blast my career if i came under their influence if a bhikkhu should desire to ride cross-legged through the sky i do not think that he will be able to do it but he will probably be able to create an illusion of doing it so strong that the illusion will see no difference between the appearance and the reality all these people are more or less adepts in the art of suggestion and auto-suggestion they have more or less control over whatever powers are involved in telepathy clairvoyance automatism and mediumship but their powers are not more interesting or wonderful than the powers of quite ordinary people who have never heard of a mahatma or else think it is the island new york city is built on for the most elementary power of telepathy and suggestion which i believe include all the others is if you come to think of it a very remarkable and significant thing almost as remarkable and significant as dreaming it means that the ordinary methods of communication by speech and sign are transcended that faith is literally the substance of things not seen a bhikkhu riding cross-legged through the sky would surely be a variety of such a substance that if it cannot move mountains or even molehills it can move molecules it can within limits break up and alter their chemical arrangements otherwise physical healing by suggestion could not occur it looks as if thoughts flew about and could be caught casually on the wing only that things do not always happen in that haphazard way there are certain clear and steady sequences that point to a definite and deliberate agency they involve desire and design the selves can apparently exert an inward spiritual influence as strong as or stronger than an outside or material stimulus suggestion then seems to be best defined as the power that immaterial beings have to make psychic events happen in this sense we may say that it covers all the ground of magic and of mysticism and the borderland it must have been used deliberately in primitive ritual and in all the mysteries it accounts for all the psychic phenomena of mysticism the miracles the visions the ecstasies the sense of union it probably accounts for the efficacy of prayer prayer is one of our oldest ancestral instincts and habits it is therefore one of the strongest engines of suggestion at our service but though it covers all the facts it does not account for all of them and it does not cover or account for itself it does not account for the supreme fact the choice of ultimate reality as the object of desire it does not account for the desire itself the hunger and the thirst for life for new life and more abundant life which is the driving motive of the mystic adventure it does not account for the gradual steady sublimation of that desire nor for the corresponding changes in the conception of its object it does not account for the means by which it is brought into operation for the ascertained uniformity in the stages of the mystic way all the world over a uniformity which raises the practice of mysticism from magic to a science and an art 
it does not account i know this statement will be challenged but i believe it does not account for the peculiar certainty that comes not always through illumination and contemplation and not through vision or ecstasy but in spite of them a certainty that is not part of the psychic phenomena at all and that so far as i know both psychic phenomena and the suggestion that gives rise to them are powerless to produce and it does not account for itself when we have said that suggestion gives rise to psychic events we do not know why or even how it does so we have not said from what centres or on what levels it is working apparently it can work from all the centres and on all the levels of our conscious or subconscious life if we say that its chief function is to create illusion we are very far from the truth its chief and highest function is to create reality to heighten the sense and sharpen the perception of reality to restore the links with reality where they have been broken otherwise there could be no healing by suggestion and the most important of its healing functions are the recovery of the lost will to live and the joining up of psychic states abnormally dissociated now in detachment the state of mystic dissociation from normal consciousness we said that two ways were made open to the psyche one looking backwards and downwards on which it can go a long way with ease and one going forwards and upwards on which it can only go a little way with difficulty and the psychic powers of the borderland can go up and down too suggestion can evoke the instincts and memories of states past and forgotten it can also invoke the instinct and the premonition of a state not attained it cannot create ultimate reality or the perception of it but it would seem that it can create a state in which for moments of most uncertain duration ultimate reality is discerned in western mysticism above all in catholic mysticism the lower and the higher forms of suggestion alternate and there is a dreadful tendency for the lower form to hold the field and if the great mystics had not been the most marvellous analyzers of their own states we should have had no possible means of distinguishing in their case between the two luckily their moments of certainty seldom if ever came when they were deliberately sought they came as they come to every one who has ever known them unsought and unexpected and with a shock of surprise in true mystic experience you may say the expected never happens still remembering the saints of the salpetriere and lady julian's morbidities and saint teresa's impetuosities and all the terrifying and revolting amorousness of the religious mystic we might suspect this certainty if these revelations were all the record that we had of it not only all religious experience is full of it but every poet every painter every musician knows the shock of contact with reality the vision of absolute beauty while it lasts is actually a laying hold on eternal life i would say every lover knows it but that sexual passion is the source of our most profound illusion still even the betrayed and disillusioned lover may know that in loving he found his own innermost reality illusion was not in him but in the perfidious heart of the beloved while he loved he truly lived nothing can take from him that certainty the wrong of sexual treachery lies in the fact that it deprives the lover for the time being of life and there is an even higher state of certainty than these almost every other hero knows it the exquisite and incredible assurance the positively ecstatic vision of reality that comes to him when he faces death for the first time there is no certainty that life can give that surpasses or even comes anywhere near it and the world has been full of these mystics these visionaries since august nineteen fourteen sometimes i think they are the only trustworthy ones how pure how absolute is their surrender how candid and untroubled their confession how spontaneous and undefiled their witness and see how they back up all the others this is the sort of certainty we want to tide us over the straits where western mysticism often leaves us floundering i say western mysticism because in the buddhist sacred books and in the upanishads and the vedanta and in the mysticism of kabir you do not find anywhere the same repulsive qualities you enter a purer and a subtler air 
and the light of godhead das fließende licht der gottheit does not flow it is strong and very still there are reasons as we shall see for this difference the western mind comes to mysticism by a peculiarly dangerous and difficult path for one thing it came to it a bit too early the art and science of it were perfected in asia if not before the first principles had been discovered in europe and asia minor at any rate long before they had had a chance to develop the christian mystics seem never to have quite perfected the technique of the thing and seldom to have achieved a perfect and a safe detachment admirable psychoanalysts as they were they lacked that minute psychological theory and practice which the indian seems undoubtedly to have possessed they plunged into the dangerous adventure without adequate preparation as one who should jump into the atlantic without a safety belt in the language of modern psychology they had not learned how to sublimate their libidos and this apparently was what the subtle indian had learned before ever he set out on the adventure the western mystic did not know or had forgotten that the desire of life even physical desire is an indestructible and holy though a dangerous thing he suppressed physical desire he stamped it down into the unconscious and then in a state of passivity or trance he went down there after it and was met by the resurgence of all his savage and ancestral memories he retrogressed he did not know that this would happen to him he knew nothing at all or very little about the unconscious and every time it did happen he was agonized and astonished but the indian mystic knew very well what would happen and why it happened and when he went travelling in the untrodden country he took good care to close the gates of the paths that led downwards sometimes they swung to of their own accord and the christian mystic was safe still there is a great gulf fixed between eastern and western mysticism sometimes the catholics bridge it when they are metaphysical which is seldom but julian of norwich for one managed to get over her first revelation of divine love might have come straight from the heart of asia in this same time our lord showed me she said a spiritual sight of his homely loving i saw that he is to us everything that is good and comfortable for us he is our clothing that for love wrappeth us claspeth us and all encloseth us for tender love that he may never leave us being to us all thing that is good as to mine understanding also in this he showed me a little thing the quantity of an hazelnut in the palm of my hand and it was as round as a ball i looked thereupon with eye of my understanding and thought what may this be and it was answered generally thus it is all that is made i marvelled how it might last for me thought it might suddenly have fallen to naught for littleness and i was answered in my understanding it lasteth and ever shall last for that god loveth it and so all thing hath the being by the love of god compare this with a well-known duologue in the kandogya upanishad fetch me from thence a fruit of the nyagrodra tree here is one sir break it it is broken sir what do you see there these seeds almost infinitesimal break one of them it is broken sir what do you see there not anything sir the father said my son that subtle essence which you do not perceive there of that very essence the great nyagrodra tree exists believe it my son that which is the subtle essence in it all that exists has its self it is the true it is the self and thou o svetaketu art it observe what is happening it is as if mr barlow were instructing sanford and merton in the hegelian dialectic observe that it is said of svetaketu that he understood yes he understood the indian takes to the absolute like a duck to water he may attain deliverance before he is sixteen instead of having to wait for it till he is sixty when the passions cease from troubling of their own accord in her clearest moments julian is as devout a pantheist as any indian mystic she had even her pantheistic formula to match the thou art it of the upanishad i it am i it am i it am that is highest 
i it am that thou lovest i it am that thou enjoyest i it am that thou servest i it am that thou longest for i it am that thou desirest i it am that thou meanest i it am that is all end of chapter seven part one section three recording by expatria in bangor maine chapter seven part two of a defence of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter seven the new mysticism part two we are very near the secret of the psychic backsliding and spiritual torment of the christian mystic they are due not only to imperfect psychological technique but to imperfect metaphysics in spite of the refinements of the schoolmen the christian idea of god was never wholly sublimated by thought it rests on a naive and obstinate dualism that resists the process it is to the east that we must turn to find the highest and the purest form of mysticism a mysticism that has passed through the fire of metaphysical thinking and is itself sublimated but before we compare western with eastern mysticism as i am going to do to the disadvantage of the christian variety three things must be kept well in sight first that the final goal of christian mysticism is not experience not vision not ecstasy but the unitive life the life lived in union with reality life lived not merely contemplated a life of fruition and activity lifted forever above the powers of the subconscious of this state evelyn underhill says that in it man's nature has become conscious in all its parts has unified itself about its highest elements that strange tormenting vision of a perfect peace a joyous self-loss annihilation in some mighty life which overpassed his own which haunts man through the whole course of his history and finds a more or less distorted expression in all his creeds a justification in all his ecstasies is now traced to its source and found to be the inevitable expression of an instinct by which he recognized though he could not attain the noblest part of his inheritance she denies on i think somewhat insufficient grounds that this state was conspicuously attained in eastern mysticism that is to say in eastern mysticism that was not influenced by christianity but the christian apologist has still to admit that in the west it was usually reached late in life and that certain physical cessations may have contributed however that may be it is the end of mystical ill-health again the christian saint brings to the quest for reality something that is not always found in mysticisms that have been highly sublimated by thought julian of norwich says of her hazelnut in this little thing i saw three properties the first is that god madeth it the second is that god loveth it the third is that god keepeth it but what is to me verily the maker the keeper and the lover i cannot tell and she speaks for all her kindred her way is the way of the mystic kabir and of the vaishnavis the humanists of india few says kabir are the lovers who know the beloved the devout seeker is he who mingles in his heart the double currents of love and detachment lastly mysticism itself is a thing of gradual development and the eastern and the western forms of it are tending to approach with the result that pantheism is absorbing christian humanism to humanism's great gain this tendency is so conspicuous in the modern literature of east and west that it may be fairly called the new mysticism it has been i think not only an affair of influence but of the slow yet inevitable maturing of the western mind it is no food for sick souls it has put the disease of asceticism behind it it is a robust and joyous mysticism reconciled to the world when sir rabindranath tagore was over here in the years before the war he told us that the destiny of the east was to spiritualize the west complacent westerners smiled at the saying as if the great poet had been offering to teach his grandmother an art that she had perfected before he was born 
yet his was simply the calm statement of a truth still if some of our poets and mystics had not gone before him we should not have been as ready for him as we were before the publication of his translation of the one hundred poems of kabir his own gitanjali stood almost alone representing for many of us all that is purest and highest in mysticism therefore i venture to repeat here what i wrote of it four years ago there is hardly a word of it that will not apply equally to the work of his forerunner kabir to the western mind there is a gulf fixed between the common human heart and transcendent being the european and the american in their quest of reality are apt to be taken in by appearances they do not readily make the great distinction that is partly why with the exception of the classics of mysticism the devotional poetry of the west catholic and protestant alike is so unsatisfying most of it is written by people who are not poets but the worst of it is that it is not supremely devotional it does not deal directly with the transcendent but proceeds fervently indeed but always by way of dogma and tradition as it were by perpetual makeshifts and through the most horrible tangle of material and carnal imagery to a visionary throne of grace you never seem to arrive your heart may be soothed by the assurance of atonement but your finer metaphysical hunger is left for ever unappeased but take these songs of divine love from the gitanjali in the deep shadows of the rainy july with secret steps thou walkest silent as night eluding all watchers the woodlands have hushed their songs and doors are all shut at every house thou art the solitary wayfarer in this deserted street o my only friend my best beloved the gates are open in my house do not pass by like a dream the day is no more the shadow is upon the earth it is time that i go to the stream to fill my pitcher i know not if i shall come back home i know not whom i shall chance to meet there at the fording in the little boat the unknown man plays upon his lute in the poems of this mystic the world appears no longer in its brutality its vehemence its swift yet dense fluidity it is seized in the very moment of its passing and fixed in the clarity and stillness of his vision it is always the same everyday world the dusty road the deserted street the solitary fording the bank in the shady lane where the yellow leaves flutter and fall at the coming of the unknown traveller the leaves rustled overhead the cuckoo sang from the unseen dark and perfume of babla flowers came from the end of the road a world vivid to every sense yet the stage of a supersensual drama the scene of the divine adventure so vivid and so actual is it that only its strange fixity stirs in you the thrill of the supersensual and through this fixity this stillness of rhythm and of mood there is a mysterious trouble and excitement an awful tension of expectancy it is the stillness of intense vibration of life inconceivably living the ecstasy of supreme passion consummated and consumed there is nothing in the western world to compare with these poems but the writings of those mystics who were also saints saint augustine saint thomas a kempis saint francis of assisi julian of norwich saint teresa saint catherine of genoa who said my me is god nor do i recognize any other me except my god himself above all saint john of the cross in the dark night of the soul upon my flowery breast holy for him and save himself for none there did i give sweet rest to my beloved one the banners of the cedar breathe thereon all these impassioned lovers of the godhead use the same language telling of the same unique experience and it is invariably the language of human passion for the simple and sufficient reason that there is no other at the same time with the exception of dante's paradiso and vita nuova it would be hard to find in all the poetry of western mysticism a perfect parallel to the passion of the gitanjali there are few western mystics who do not somewhere betray the restlessness that lies around their rest until the final attainment of the unitive life their peace would seem to have been harder won to be held more perilously 
to be always on the point of passing so vivid is the sense they give of effort of struggle of frantic desperation there is a corresponding vehemence and violence in their language st teresa says of the state of the enraptured soul no consolation reaches it from heaven and it is not there itself it wishes for none from earth and it is not there either but it is as it were crucified between earth and heaven enduring its passion st john of the cross speaks of an intense and amorous impetus answering to st teresa's impetuosities for as we have seen the language of the catholic mystic is often the language of sensuous almost of sensual emotion so voluptuous that it lends itself very easily to the interpretation of the profane but it is impossible to doubt the spirituality of these bengali songs of divine love they are at the very highest level of attainment in their kind they have the serenity and purity of supreme possession mystic passion embraces while it transcends the whole range of human passion like human passion it works through body heart and soul it is the soul and the heart of passion that you find in the gitanjali its secret and invisible things small and great all in it that is superb inviolate undying all that is lowly and most fragile its impalpable incommunicable moods its evanescences its dreams its subtleties its reticences and courtesies its fears and delicate shames i asked nothing from thee i uttered not my name to thine ear when thou took'st thy leave i stood silent there is no querulousness and no grossness of impatience no restlessness in this passion of the expectant soul and on the part of the pursuing god there are none of those impetuosities that overwhelm st teresa he comes with silent steps he is the lover waiting in the shadows he is the watcher by the bed wayfarer in the deserted street the traveller at the well he is krishna the lute-player the unknown man playing in the little boat at the fording i know nothing so persuasive as the glamour of this eastern stillness nothing that evokes so irresistibly so inevitably the sense of the unseen there where spreads the infinite sky for the soul to take her flight in reigns the stainless white radiance there is no day nor night nor form nor colour and never never a word before this austerity and restraint all foregoing comparisons break down there is through all their likeness an unmistakable difference between those great western mystics and rabindranath tagore their passion utters a more poignant lyrical cry they experience a more violent rapture in union and a deeper tragedy in separation nothing could well be further from his spirit than their emotionalism individual temperament has no doubt something to do with it but it is not the whole secret this tumult and tragic pain of theirs has its own law it displays itself in proportion to their asceticism to the violence of their rupture with the divine invisible world it is the outcome of the dualism inherent in christianity there never was a religion that promised so much and gave so little that kept man's soul in such an awful poise between heaven and hell that left his passion for god so agonized and unappeased its dualism its asceticism frustrates the longing of its saints their holiest ecstasies are troubled with the resurgence of the source it has polluted to the devotee of a creator inconceivably different infinitely remote and separate from his creation the visible world is necessarily undivine abhorrent and unholy in renouncing the world the eastern ascetic denies its reality but the christian in the very act of renunciation affirms its shocking independent entity thus his deliverance is never either physically or metaphysically complete that is the christian's tragedy he cannot without an agonizing struggle get rid of the world that weighs on him whereas it is comparatively easy for the oriental to divest himself as it were of his cosmic clothing it is doubtful if any eastern ascetic brahmin or buddhist could feel the same furious hatred and horror of the world seeing that to him the world the whole visible universe is at its worst no more than an illusion 
you may refuse to become attached to an illusion you may withdraw from it with every circumstance of profound repudiation but you cannot furiously hate and abhor a thing which for you has no real existence of its own in the gitanjali you will find none of this hatred and abhorrence none either of this serene indifference and denial deliverance is not for me in renunciation i will never shut the doors of my senses the delights of sight and hearing and touch will bear thy delight what divine drink he cries wouldst thou have my god from the overflowing cup of my life and again echoing kabir the same stream of life that runs through my veins night and day runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measures it is the same life that shoots in joy through the dust of the earth in numberless blades of grass and breaks into tumultuous waves of leaves and flowers is it beyond thee he asks to be glad with the gladness of this rhythm to be tossed and lost and broken in the whirl of this fearful joy to him the life of god is an abounding joy that scatters and gives up and dies every moment the whole complexity of things the veil of maya the illusion of the world is simple and translucent to him so simple and so translucent that reality is neither hidden by it nor obscured that wearing of the veil of illusion is the jest of the divine lover hiding himself from his beloved that he may be the more passionately desired it is he he says who weaves the web of this maya in evanescent hues of gold and silver blue and green and lets peep out through the folds his feet at whose touch i forget myself everywhere in these poems there is this acceptance of humanity this ecstasy of joy in movement and in beauty this adoration of life let all the strains of joy mingle in my last song the joy that makes the earth flow over in the riotous excess of the grass the joy that sets the twin brothers life and death dancing over the wide world the joy that sweeps in with the tempest shaking and waking all life with laughter the joy that sits still with its tears on the open red lotus of pain and the joy that throws everything it has upon the dust and knows not a word it looks at first sight as if this all-embracing mysticism were different in its very nature from the view of the catholic recluse prisoned in his cell and it has apparently even less affinity with indian mysticism of the pantheistic type and this is a little disconcerting surely you say there must be things in the upanishads from which some at least of these poems are descended you take down your upanishads and hunt through them excitedly for those things but in vain unless you are prepared to accept wholesale the interpretation of the ingenious ramanuja who contended that even in union with brahma the individual self maintained its separate identity and it is only now and again in the gitanjali that there comes any reverberation of the mystic words thou art it of those resonant and resplendent passages which proclaim the absolute inseparable identity of all things of all selves in the great self now the metaphysician may deny or affirm that identity as his appetite or his instinct prompts him nothing can be more certain than that for some mystics the personal relation is an experience a fact all the same it and the separation it implies is an experience and a fact that begins and ends in their own individual consciousness it is irreducible indescribable incommunicable metaphysically it stands for nothing more nor less than that moment in which the human soul becomes conscious of itself in god the thing is duplex only in one aspect around it continuing in it and transcending it are all the unity all the identity you can desire the separation is not real not absolute any more than death or birth is it is part of the illusion part of the great game the hiding and seeking of thee and me it is the pang of separation that spreads throughout the world and gives birth to shapes innumerable in the infinite sky it is this sorrow of separation that gazes in silence all night from star to star and becomes lyric among rustling leaves in rainy darkness of july it is this overspreading pain that deepens into loves and desires into sufferings and joys in human homes and this it is that ever melts and flows in song through my poet's heart.
to find rabindranath tagore's true sources and affinities you must go back first of all to the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries to kabir the mystic to the great vaishnavists who were the humanists of india to chandidas the poet to chaitanya devi the god intoxicated saint and seer but going back further still as far back as you can go you find this naif personal attitude in the vedic hymns the ancient rishis as lamentably as any christian felt self to be separated from their deity or deities by the fact of sin it was those who came after them the more philosophic rishis of the upanishads the buddhists who came after them and the expert metaphysicians of the vedanta who reversed this view and found sin in the illusion of separation and all the later mystic poetry of india from kabir onwards springs from the conflict and reconciliation between that immemorial feeling of separation and that profound and supersensual certainty of oneness this indeed is the source of all the mysticism that ever was only in india the feeling of separation is the baffling thing the supersensual certainty is taken for granted while in christianity it is all the other way in india it is simply a question of whether you are going to agree say with the ingenious ramanuja that the individual soul preserves its identity in union or with the learned sankaracharya that it has never had any separate identity to lose or with the poets who are the seers of reality that it may have identity and lose it and recover it and lose it again for there is always this third alternative it is clear that what the mystics are seeking is transcendent identity there are three who by their double genius of passion and of insight have the right to speak for all of them one is julian of norwich till i am substantially one to him she says i may never have full rest nor very bliss that is to say till i be so fastened to him that there is right naught that is made betwixt my god and me one is rabindranath tagore and one is the greatest of them all kabir kabir is a test case before the appearance of the one hundred poems translated and edited by rabindranath tagore and evelyn underhill the only kabir that i could lay my hands on was a book of select passages translated and edited by a christian missionary i don't suggest that the missionary did anything to kabir still the repudiators of pantheistic monism have used kabir freely as a proof that christianity had spiritualized india and when this was all we had of him it was possible to admit that there might be something in it at least it was possible to give the dualists the benefit of a doubt i find that i gave it them myself in nineteen thirteen when i could write this sort of thing kabir i wrote conscious of the separation conceives union as a mingling in which the soul is certainly not lost the soul atma and the great soul param atma for many ages remained apart the true guru or teacher came as a dealer and made of them a beauteous mixture the power that cannot be described the form that imparts life whoever becomes one with him as milk with water that man says kabir to dharm das kali cannot destroy thou art the ocean i am the fish of the water he says i dwell in the water without the water i am done for but he does not say he is a dewdrop and that he slips into the shining sea and though he protests whatever i did you did i did nothing myself should men say i did it it was in your strength that it was done he makes it clear that he preserves his separate identity all the same End quote. the champions of christian dualism are welcome to all they can get out of kabir's fish and his milk and his middleman and to all they can get out of any other image he may use to express his relation to the absolute i cannot conceive how they can read the rest of the hundred poems and not see that india has absorbed him body and soul he has the true intransigence of the convert he is closer far closer than tagore to the pure metaphysical monism svetasvatara upanishad his mysticism is only free from metaphysics because it has passed through the last fires of thought it is utterly sublimated take the least metaphysical and most purely poetic of the hundred poems tell me o swan your ancient tale from what land do you come o swan to what shore will you fly where would you take your rest o swan and what do you seek even this morning o swan awake arise follow me 
there is a land where no doubt nor sorrow have rule where the terror of death is no more there the woods of spring are a bloom and the fragrant scent he is i is borne on the wind there the bee of the heart is deeply immersed and desires no other joy again the creature is in brahma and brahma is in the creature they are ever distinct yet ever united he himself is the tree the seed and the germ he himself is the flower the fruit and the shade he himself is the sun the light and the lighted he himself is brahma creature and maya he himself is the manifold form the infinite space he is the breath the word and the meaning he himself is the limit and the limitless and beyond both the limit and the limitless is he the pure being he is the immanent mind in brahma and in the creature he is immersed in all consciousness all joys and all sorrows he has no beginning and no end he holds all within his bliss before the unconditioned the condition dances thou and i are one his trumpet proclaims the water-filled pitcher is placed upon water it has water within and without it should not be given a name lest it call forth the error of dualism what could possibly be plainer the true name he writes again is like none other name the distinction of the conditioned from the unconditioned is but a word the unconditioned is the seed the conditioned is the flower and the fruit knowledge is the branch and the name is the root look and see where the root is happiness shall be yours when you come to the root the root will lead you to the branch the leaf the flower and the fruit it is the encounter with the lord it is the attainment of bliss it is the reconciliation of the conditioned and the unconditioned evelyn underhill points out in her introduction that the mystic intuition recognizes a universe of three orders becoming being and that which more than being that is god it is well said and yet i confess i don't see how the haters of monism can without blushing quote kabir any longer in support of their contention nor how the apologist for christianity can conjure a trinity out of him his world of becoming is surely the world of maya of illusion and the world of illusion like dr mctaggart's absolute is not a person as for the error of dualism it may have touched the ingenious ramanuja but it certainly does not seem to have contaminated kabir in his world discussions as to individuality lost or individuality preserved have little meaning end of chapter seven part two recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter seven part three of a defense of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter seven the new mysticism part three now it is quite clear that in the classics of mysticism we are dealing not only with a peculiar kind of experience but with a peculiar kind of genius and again having made all allowance for the influence of mystical ill-health the lover of literature must protest against the grossness of the interpretations that have been brought to these texts the writings of the great mystics are not all charged with unsublimated libido i do not see how we can deny that julian of norwich has the imagination and the style of a great poet as well as the temperament of a saint nobody but a poet could have conceived such blending of loveliness in horror to bring nothing but the literalism of the pathologist to bear on her revelations is absurd even in the worst instances i am thinking of certain utterances of gertrude of eisleben of the blessed angela of foligno and of st teresa herself there is a perpetual striving after something stronger than the soul's passive blessedness and higher than its voluptuous spiritual ecstasy this excess of feeling demands and finds expression now and then it flashes into metaphysical intuition again it crystallizes into some perfect and transparent phrase and you have the beginning of a naive art and where art is there is sublimation thus the blessed angela says that the divine love came towards me after the manner of a sickle not that there was any actual and reasonable likeness 
but when first it appeared unto me it did not give itself unto me in such abundance as i expected but part of it was withdrawn therefore do i say after the manner of a sickle the blessed angela may or may not be deceived as to the spiritual nature of her experience however that may be two things are clear that she is using the language of poetic imagination and that she is struggling with almost fantastic honesty for precision of language and of thought it seems to me that whatever their spiritual value may be such utterances should be judged not with the crude literalism of her critics and of her admirers but with the liberal judgment accorded to works of the imagination but no professor jung finds megalomania in an ancient egyptian text the hymn of the ascending soul proclaiming its unity with god i am the god atum i who alone was i am the god re at his first splendour i am the great god self-created god of gods to whom no other god compares my impurity is driven away and the sin which was in me is overcome i washed myself in those two great pools of water which are in heracleopolis in which is purified the sacrifice of mankind for the great god who abideth there thou who standest before me stretch out to me thy hands it is i i am become one of thee daily am i together with my father atum he finds resurgent lust in the brahmin's vision of the absolute the person he says of the size of a thumb stands in the middle of the self as lord of the past and the future and henceforward fears no more this is that that person of the size of a thumb is like a light without smoke lord of the past and future he is the same to-day and to-morrow this is that the person not larger than a thumb dwelling within always dwelling in the heart of man is perceived by the heart the thought the mind they who know it become immortal professor jung's interpretation of these passages is entirely freudian at this rate there is no reason why he should not find megalomania and resurgent lust in dedekind's and cantor's theories of the infinite or in mr bertrand russell's pursuit of the fourth dimension on the grounds that they involve generation of series we have admitted that psychoanalysis had much to say but when it has said it the secret of mystic passion and of mystic certainty remain alike insoluble its criticism rests on the assumption that ends have the same form as origins which is contrary not only to evolution but to the psychoanalyst's own pet theory of sublimation but this arraignment of mysticism need not concern us any more it only applies to those manifestations that belong to the transition periods of its childhood and its youth where they persist they persist by way of survival or reaction or disease and they are doomed to disappear for if we are right in supposing that what is supernormal consciousness now will be normal consciousness some day we may expect its perfection to be reached by forgetfulness of its old labour and effort unconsciousness of the very practice that will have made it perfect pantheistic mysticism begins where mysticism that are not pantheistic end it takes for granted that as between god and the world the absolute and the finite selves there is no separation for all her catholic sympathies evelyn underhill is a pantheist at heart witness her immanence in theophanies i come in the little things saith the lord yea on the glancing wings of eager birds the softly pattering feet of furred and gentle beasts i come to meet your hard and wayward heart in brown bright eyes that peep from out the brake i stand confessed on every nest where feathery patience is content to brood and leaves her pleasure for the high emprise of motherhood there doth my godhead rest and m bergson though his logic lands him sometimes in an upsetting dualism is a good pantheist at heart he sees as the mystic sees that the elan vital is the energy of one being which makes matter its means of manifestation its vehicle its tool he sees that the process of becoming is a spiritual process of ascension thus though we cannot say what the mysticism of the future will be we may be pretty sure what it will not be it will not be sickly it will not be morbid and hysterical or sentimental in exchanging god the father for god the absolute self 
it will have lost that irresponsible dependence which has kept men and women for centuries in a pathetic infancy sooner or later the mystic has to grow up like other people he will know that he fulfils the absolute purpose best by trying to become as far as possible a self-determined being he knows already that if auto-suggestion is anything at all it is self-determination and he will not be violent the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence until now and the violent take it by force that was where the imperfect mystic made his great mistake just as primitive man desired to get by magic physical things that would have come to him without it of their own accord in due season so the imperfect mystic desires to get spiritual things by mysticism that will come to him without it of their own accord in due season the savage is trying to force nature's hand the imperfect mystic is trying to force god's hand not so the accomplished lover of the absolute his passion may be overpowering and importunate but not its method he will not forestall its perfect consummation by one hour the more certain he is the more he can afford to wait kabir says stay where you are and all things shall come to you in time end of chapter seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eight part one section one of a defence of idealism by may sinclair this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eight conclusions part one section one it is clear that we have to choose between some form of pluralism and monism there is nothing new in this it is the old problem and the old choice that has lain before philosophy in the beginning but with this difference that whereas philosophy had no valid grounds for a conclusion as long as it travelled on the high priori road it is now in a rather better position for bringing its conclusions to the test of experience it is not and it cannot be a question of certainty no reasonable person demands certainty at this time of day the utmost he is entitled to demand is a certain balance of probabilities perhaps not even that perhaps only here a balance and there a chance and there again an off chance a bare possibility so instead of asking which conclusion is the more certain we may only ask which hypothesis pluralism or monism is the more likely the more in keeping with the facts this is not a pragmatic question nor is it a pragmatic test it is not to be confused with the demand that metaphysical truth should square with the requirements of human conduct by the facts i do not mean merely the facts of life i mean the sum total of our knowledge or knowledges up to date our knowledge of consciousness and our knowledge of knowledge must take their place in the collection together with our knowledge of the so-called external world the facts therefore will not all stand on an equal footing the ultimate appeal must always be to the knowledge of knowledge if the facts favour one hypothesis more than the other then we may ask further which hypothesis has the better metaphysical support if we are lucky enough to get a reasonable conformity on all heads then and not till then we may ask further which hypothesis pluralism or monism is on the whole more satisfying to collective human emotion and to the moral sense and we must be very careful that by these we do not mean more satisfying to me at first sight it looks as if pluralism had all the facts on its side it can point to a universe in which the earth is a comparatively insignificant dot on a field covered with several million heavenly bodies a physical universe of apparently unending multiplicity of apparently unending change and flux it can break up the flux itself into an infinity of elements of which you can only say that each is where it is at the instant when it is supposing matter to be made up of an infinite number of atoms or if you like of electrons it cannot be said with positive certainty that any atom yet discovered is ultimate and indivisible pluralism can refer us to a world of selves of psychic entities 
whose chief distinction is that they repel and repudiate each other besides harbouring a host of conflicting instincts desires and memories whose presence makes for continual disruption consciousness itself abounding with irreconcilable multiplicities foremost among these are pain and evil which outrage every just and compassionate and holy instinct of the selves pluralism can even insist with considerable plausibility on a final and irreconcilable dualism between these two worlds and its very logic its knowledge of knowledge is atomistic and yet the pluralist himself must admit that this is an inadequate and superficial view of the facts the more we explore this multiplicity the more it reveals the secret of its unity and this unity is not simply imposed on multiplicity by immediate consciousness and by the laws of thought it is not only a question of the way we are obliged to think things but of the way things behave every generalization of physical science and every correlation of physical laws amounts to a plain statement that within the range of the generalization the order of things is one the law of conservation of energy is nothing if not a confession that as far as the physical world goes incorrigible multiplicity and difference do not obtain it would even seem that ultimately the entire physical world is definable in terms of energy and if the ultimate constitution of matter is invisible imponderable impalpable to any sense its density disappeared long ago if all the grossness all the heaviness and hardness all the intractable lumpiness of matter all its so-called material qualities are not to be found in it but only in our consciousness of it we need no longer juggle with terms that are so interchangeable the realist and idealist are both agreed that there is no physical it behind those qualities and unless we are satisfied that he is right in contending that they exist on their own we may as well say straight out that these two worlds anyhow are one and that the ultimate reality of matter is spiritual energy we have seen that it is his implacable moral consciousness that urges the pragmatist to plant his pluralism in the very heart of reality itself and to insist that there is no ultimate spiritual energy one in many forms but that there are as many energies as there are forms and that spiritual energy is only one of them i hope it has also been seen how his moral consciousness goes back on him and lands him in the oneness he abhors and in the world of living organisms before a moral consciousness was ever heard of we saw that the life force the will to live revealed itself in the process of evolution as one indestructible energy and one desire striving for fulfilment and for sublimation an energy made manifest in such forms and in such manner as to declare its spiritual source we saw that the mere physical process was only intelligible if we admitted the psychic factors of desire and design we saw the growth and building up and shaping of the organism by the psyche for its own ends we saw that desire and design and performance were only intelligible if we presupposed a self that is something over and above its memory we saw that biology so far from merging the individual self in its own ancestral heritage presupposes its independence and its supreme importance as a factor in heredity itself we found confirmation of this view where we least expected it in the facts of psychopathology and the results of psychoanalysis they showed us one indestructible primal energy at work in all the functions of the psyche they showed the persistent symbols of its presence throughout the whole region of the unconscious they showed that all aberrations and perversions are reversions the turning back of the individual on the ancestral paths by which he came they also showed by what processes of sublimation he asserts himself against the backward pull of the instincts that tend to merge him with the race again psychology besides endorsing the biological evidence showed us that consciousness is a unity that could hardly be if there were no self over and above consciousness unaffected by its multiplicity its change and flux we found that the self is not passive and that thought has its own energetic way of dealing with the stuff of consciousness that it multiplies and divides makes finite and makes infinite 
and that of all that it scatters it gathers again apart from the work of thought we found that the stuff of consciousness is not divided that it is given in a continuous unity that its sequences overlap and that states of consciousness have more than sequence as william james says they have thickness and we saw that if anything ever was one it is this thickness we found that here our choice lay between animism and psychophysical parallelism we saw how the dualism of the parallelist breaks down under an examination of the psychophysical facts we also found that psychology was powerless to solve its own problems and flung us back on metaphysics we had then to choose between some form of pluralism and monism we were obliged to dismiss all a priori arguments for monism as worthless so long as they remained unsupported by actual experience and so long as they left whole tracts of experience out of their account but so far as they explain experience and so far as experience corroborates them they are not to be lightly set aside after all our way of thinking justifies itself where the necessities of thought agree with the necessities implied by the behaviour of consciousness and the behaviour of things they must count as real necessities our problem then was is unity or is boundless multiplicity the supreme necessity of thought comparing one philosophical system with another we thought we saw that the end and goal of the metaphysical quest has been mainly one ultimate principle rather than two or more ultimate principles we found this secret passion for the absolute and the one breaking out in the very dualisms that repudiated it and we traced the root and the cause of all philosophical dilemmas to the search for oneness and for ultimate reality in the wrong place pragmatism and humanism stood out as the great exceptions if you cannot say that they have looked for ultimate reality in the wrong place since they were not looking for it at all they have looked on at the usurpation of its place and power and pragmatism betrayed its own inherent dilemmas on the balance of the evidence before us we were driven to the conclusion that the ultimate reality of things and the ultimate reality of consciousness is one and that this one reality is spirit we might have rested there complacent and happy but for the new realism whose violence took our kingdom of heaven by storm and so our problem narrowed itself down we had to choose between our spiritualistic monism and this particular brand of realistic pluralism we distinguished between the premises and the conclusions of the new realism between its science and its system and again between its construction and its critique we found that while much of its critique must be of enduring value in philosophy it applied rather to the pseudomonisms than to ours we found that though its foundations were sure as the axioms of pure mathematics and of analytic logic could make them the superstructures reared on this imposing base were somewhat lacking in coherence and solidity we found that in applying the axioms and conclusions of the mathematical and physical sciences as a test of the reality of phenomena it has brought us no nearer to the root of the question in debate the nature of ultimate reality and though we were prepared to admit it was within its rights in renouncing the quest of ultimate reality we found that it failed to establish its negative conclusions beyond the reach of doubt and that its positive conclusions yielded contradictions every bit as compromising to it as those it undertook to solve we also saw that it was possible to state the principle of spiritualistic monism in terms which at any rate exclude contradiction thus we conceded that as a restatement of mathematical and logical first principles the new realism is almost as impregnable as it professes to be but in spite of its combined air of certainty and scientific caution we could not admit that as a system of metaphysics it justifies its existence better than other philosophies that plunge therefore my imaginary monist refused to relinquish the principle he perhaps rashly stakes his all on he refused to be driven from his position by the multiplicity of anything that pluralism or science for that matter has to show he is not going to be scared out of it by the bluff of physical atomism he does not care how many elements are involved in magnetic force or how many tricks the physicist's mysterious electrons play him why should he 
once his absolute starts the business of appearing a little multiplicity more or less cannot break it he would not be greatly distressed if the law of conservation of energy were exploded to-morrow as it very well may be it does not matter to him how many appearances and laws of appearances there may be two or three million or an infinite number if anything he prefers an infinite number because it provides him with the reassuring contradictions he is looking for it will be said of my monist that he cannot clear himself of one reproach from first to last he is only juggling with the unity of consciousness which his opponents do not admit to be a unity at all and he must admit not that he has helped himself to the unity of consciousness but that the unity of consciousness has helped him considerably it is only not a unity if you adopt the extreme realistic theory of knowledge which he thinks he has shown good reason for repudiating it is the only thorough-going unity he knows he finds this unity not in or among his states of consciousness shaken about with them in the same bag as it were but in the irreducible ultimate fact of selfhood he finds that the self resists all attempts to analyze it into the separate states or stages of its own consciousness that it is more than the sum of these states more that is to say than consciousness to this something more he gives the name of spirit for the reason that while in ultimate analysis matter may be resolvable into terms of immaterial being spirit or self is not by any means so resolvable into terms of matter before monism can work it must have a principle which shall be both static and dynamic but as long as the monist was tied to his bare epistemology he could find no means of defining thought so as to include in it things that are not thoughts to say that thought thinks itself is not enough from the unsubstantial forms of its thinking it can build no bridge from its own world to the world where things are and are done but spirit can be supposed to do things he can define it as that which thinks and wills and energizes in one undivided act his principle is as static and dynamic as he pleases if he is asked whether he has any precise conception of the principle to which he gives the name of spirit he can at least answer that his definition amounts to a fairly precise conception if he is asked if he has any conception at all of the ultimate nature of self or spirit he can retort that he has no more conception of the ultimate nature of self or spirit than the new realist has of the ultimate constitution of matter or of consciousness or of universals and he claims the realist's right not to go behind reality but to regard it as itself ultimate and irreducible if he is asked how he proposes to justify his leap from the presumably finite and relative self or spirit of which he has a more or less precise conception to the self or spirit he is declared to be absolute he must own that he is not justified in making any leap he can only say that in the unity of his own consciousness the term spirit covers will and action and passion as well as thought and sense he finds that love and thought and will behave as energies as motive powers or even as causes within the unity of his consciousness he has every reason for concluding that they behave as energies and motive powers or even as causes in other consciousnesses besides his own and he sees no reason why they should not behave with greater energy and motive power and causal efficiency within greater consciousnesses than his or other people's he finds that the behaviour of this finite and relative consciousness of his its knowledge and its relation to its knowledge are inexplicable without the assumption of an infinite and absolute consciousness as the ground of all its knowing he finds that the very existence of his self is inexplicable without the assumption of an absolute self-subsisting self as the ground of its existence and his real self and he sees no reason why the spiritual energies of such a self should not be equal to the evolution of such manifestations as this spectacular universe and its spectators in the matter of manifestation he knows that if his own self is to know itself and to make itself known it must think and feel and will and act through forms and forces that are called material and so he sees no reason why the absolute spirit his real self 
desiring to know itself and to make itself known should not manifest itself also through forms and forces that are called material he sees no reason why not and nobody has yet advanced any really valid and satisfactory reason why not if this is to juggle he juggles no really valid reason why not but one apparently valid reason which is the crux of pantheism the alleged absurdity of a reality knowing itself and making itself known through what is after all an endless procession of spectacular illusions at this rate it may be said the absolute is juggling too and there is a sort of general feeling that it is beneath its dignity to juggle end of chapter eight part one section one recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eight part one section two of a defence of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eight conclusions part one section one now it is pretty certain judging by appearances that if the absolute had stood on its dignity it would never have appeared at all it is also certain that so far as there is any meaning in this objection it is our sense of dignity that is offended and our sense of dignity is part of the illusion still a talent for producing endless illusions about itself does seem incompatible with a veracious reality we might of course credit reality with the utmost veracity of its absolute and transcendent self and charge all the illusion to the account of the finite selves but the trouble is that on the theory reality is also supposed to be appearing to itself getting to know itself introducing itself to itself as it were through an endless round of cosmic at homes if the round is really endless it cannot any more than a finite self succeed in completely making its own acquaintance and the pluralist has every right to ask the monist what he is going to do about it now i think it must be owned that this endless procession or series of manifestations does land the monist in a very awkward predicament if he really means that a complete knowledge of every single one of its finite manifestations in time is necessary to the self's absolute knowledge of itself the only thing he can do is not to take that line his only possible reply is that on realism's own showing knowledge depends on universals not on simple enumeration of particulars and that if it is not necessary for a finite self to reel off a list of all the particulars it knows before it can be said to know anything it must be still more unnecessary for an absolute and infinite self to know every single one of its manifestations before it knows itself on the contrary just because it is absolute as well as infinite it must be supposed to know itself completely at each instant of its manifestation there are however considerable difficulties about an absolute reality that insists on publishing itself as it were in serial instalments but i think they must be charged to the account of the finite selves who are obliged to take in their absolute in serial form they arise from our persistent habit of regarding the self's knowledge of the finite as a finite knowledge and its passage through time as part of its eternity practically the reverse problem is presented by the existence of evil the pragmatist complains that you are taking a moral holiday if you refuse to regard such things as badness and nastiness and silliness and ugliness and a kick in the ribs as so many knock-you-down arguments against monism well you have not got to take a moral holiday to see that they are staggering facers for the realist who regards them as eternal and immutable realities the realist having apparently no other outlet for his cosmic emotion grows almost lyrical over his incorruptible world of the universals enduring for ever and ever out of space out of time in their stainless intangible perfection but if goodness and niceness and wisdom and loveliness and the absence of a kick in the ribs are realities that endure for ever and ever so are badness and nastiness and the rest of it i do not know how the realist contrives to have his emotion 
i suppose he just thinks of beauty and goodness sitting up there and tries to forget that his wife's temper and the kitchen saucepan are sitting there too he cannot conjure them out of his universe by any juggling they are absolute he has said it what is even worse every particular instance of badness and nastiness and silliness is absolute too the realist may say that silliness is not silly but what he means is that it is something far sillier but the monist saves the essential cleanness and sanity of the universe in denying that nastiness and silliness and a kick in the ribs subsist as such and as realities in the transcendent life of spirit he denies that the absolute is obliged to listen for ever and ever to the stories that brown tells robinson when mrs robinson has left the room if in the infinite reverberations of the universe there endure infinite echoes of brown's story they are echoes that only finite and incarnate spirits catch and if you insist that as imminent in the finite and all too incarnate spirit of robinson the absolute has heard brown's story and enjoyed it and that as imminent in the finite spirit of brown it has also told it the monist will have no objection provided you add that as imminent in the person of mrs robinson it has disapproved of it and of brown and of robinson severely he might go farther and affirm that there is justification for the apparently incredible and inexcusable existence of brown and robinson light is thrown on their mystery by the existence of mrs robinson whose spiritual beauty is set off and made more desirable by contrast whose spiritual strength grows by exercise in the gymnasium of spiritual adversity that marriage to robinson provides for her why rush the discords in but that harmony should be prized that the dependence of goodness upon evil the endurance of evil for the sake of good was the old idealism's solution of the moral problem not a bad solution as far as it went whenever you could get it to go the evil is null is naught is silence implying sound yes it is all very soul-stirring and uplifting but it is not true in the world where its truth matters this tragic world of space and time the pleasant fancy of evil as negation is no more convincing to a logical mind than it is consoling and satisfying to the unreasoning heart it won't work it won't wash go to the victims of war and pestilence and tell them that their torment is only the opposite of rapture tell a starving population that its hunger is merely the absence of satisfaction tell the sweated workers in the east end that their poverty is purely relative to affluence and but subserves another's gain tell a mother who has just lost her only son that bereavement is simply the negation of possession and see how it washes and works besides if you are going to take it that way goodness will be null in itself will be naught in itself will be sound implying silence and depending on silence there is nothing to be said for pain and evil thus devitalized you have robbed them of their only title to existence when you have taken away their positive and stimulating character their antagonism their brave stoic challenge to the fighter they are not negative they are tremendous powers they call forth all the stern virtues and all the tendernesses that without them could not have been they make and remake the souls of saints and heroes by even sordid suffering decently born the humblest and most insignificant soul may be exalted you may know that all this is true you may know that great suffering great adversity may be the greatest and the best thing that can happen to anybody you may know that your own suffering your own adversity was the best thing that could have happened to you and you would not if you could have spared yourself one single pang of it but you also know that there are vast millions of other people for whom suffering and adversity are not good at all for whom none of these truths are true and when all is said and done it is intolerable that these people should suffer it is intolerable that the heroic and tender virtues of a few superior persons should be nourished on the sufferings of these millions it is really paying too big a price for individual virtue nobody has any right to be either compassionate or heroic at his or her neighbour's expense and no theory can make it tolerable but it may be more intolerable on one theory than on another 
and it is most intolerable on the theory that makes pain and evil real and absolute and eternal and that allows for no vision of any state of being in which they cease to be the one thing that helps us to endurance is our sense that pain and evil have not after all an immortal life the one thing that makes them intelligible is the assumption that the only life they have is an unreal one the one thing that would make them bearable would be the unshakable conviction that we have an immortal life in which they are overcome in which we receive or make for ourselves or give to others whom we have injured compensation the demand for compensation is a humanistic and pragmatic demand and belongs to another line of argument altogether of purely metaphysical theories monism is the only one that supports our sense of the illusion of evil and the assumption of its unreality now true as it may be his theory of the mere relativity of evil does not carry the monist very far still as long as he had no other solution of the problem he was glad enough to be delivered from the horror of real evil eternalized and absolute even at the cost of parting forever with real good eternalized and absolute but this awful choice is no longer binding on him the new realism has taught him how he may raise up the new idealism on the ruins of the old he is dead right about the relativity of the evil that we know the goods and evils of our earthly life are purely relative both to each other and to human conditions they are even interchangeable goodness may be sought for now in this set of actions now in that it may be attached to things once accounted evil evil may be attached to things once accounted good goodness itself remains as an eternal and immutable idea it may or it may not be real the finite selves do not know it as a reality they only know it as a mysterious logical function by which its appearances are recognized and known what it may be in itself or in the absolute they do not know badness also remains as an eternal and immutable idea so that we do not seem to have gained much but we have gained this that we are not compelled to attribute reality to badness it also is for us the mysterious and harmless logical function by which its appearances are recognized and known what it may be in itself or in the absolute the finite selves do not know they only know and this is our immense gain that in themselves or in the absolute goodness and badness are no longer relative to each other therefore it will not follow that if one is real in the absolute self the other also is real and that if one is the complete and perfect expression of the transcendent nature of that self the other is its complete and perfect expression it will not follow that if goodness is all-powerful badness is all-powerful too it will not follow that badness is more than the logical function of knowledge we already know it to be but all these consequences follow rigorously and inevitably from the realistic theory of universals the new realism closes the door to any possibility that the lovers of goodness can endure to contemplate the new idealism leaves the door open to our vision of goodness beauty and truth eternal and real surpassing all goods and beauties and truths we know incorruptible inassailable by evil it may be that some universals are only logical functions and that such ideas will have no more than a potential immortality and that evil ugliness and the rest may be such ideas so that for a self that refused to know evil and ugliness or had no longer any use for such knowledge evil and ugliness would literally not be we have seen that the old idealism with its doctrine of relativity deprived us of our highest moral ideal without any compensation for the loss beyond its academic assurance of the illusory character of evil we have seen that pragmatism and humanism provided no metaphysical ground for the ethical claim they make paramount and that pragmatism at any rate sets up a false and unethical criterion of the good we have seen that the new realism threatens us with the eternal reality of evil where so much is uncertain i do not want to claim a superior certainty for this tentative reconstruction that i call the new idealism but i do think that more surely than any other theory it opens a way of escape from the worst entanglements of the moral problem meanwhile it should be clearly understood 
that my monist distinction between appearance and reality is not a distinction that robs one single appearance of its own peculiar and relative reality on the contrary he would not be a good monist if he did not contend that the absolute reality which is spirit is its own appearances his principle is such that it confers more reality on appearances than it takes away there is no earthly reason why he should not call himself a realist except that the title has already been appropriated by his opponents he is only obliged to insist on his distinction in order to resist the conclusion they offer him as an alternative what he says is this multiplicity and change that you find in the universe i also find there is not one sensible or intelligible fact in the whole collection to which i should refuse the name of reality provided it be understood that not one of these is the reality i am looking for there is no sort of necessity to go out and look for multiplicity and change when you have got them all around you i want to know what if anything lies behind or at the bottom of multiplicity and change you say there is nothing behind or at the bottom of them and that change and multiplicity are sufficient unto themselves and i repeat are they i ask you how there can be multiplicity without something that multiplies itself or change without something that persists throughout change it is not that you cannot conceive multiplicity without unity or change without the unchanging you can very well conceive them by a process of logical disintegration it is that that without the unchanging one the many and the changing cannot be take away the persistent reality underlying any process of change or any chain of changes and both process and chain split up into an infinite series of which you cannot say of any one moment that it constitutes a change everything is at the infinitely divisible instant when it is you have in fact no change at all but the monotony of an endless series of absolute entities the one underlying reality then is the only means by which a process of change can be carried on and this whether you regard a process of change incorrectly as an unending chain laid out along one straight line or correctly as an intricate system of apparently unending chains whatever charges can be brought against this form of monism it cannot be tacked with thinness or barrenness or immobility nothing well could be thicker more multitudinous and less monotonous than the life of a self and spirit that is one but by every retrenchment of its unity that is to say by cutting it off from any section of the universe you at once diminish its multiplicity and deprive your section of the possibility of change by removing it altogether the pluralistic realist knocks the bottom out of his pluriverse it is even more obvious that if this self or spirit is to be conscious of the change and multiplicity of its own manifestations it must be one for if it ceased to be one and the same self at each moment of change no moment of these momentary selves could be more than one momentary monotone thus pluralistic realism robs its spectacle of any continuous spectator and so on a balance of considerations my monist refuses to relinquish his principle at the same time he must be prepared to relinquish it the instant he receives proof positive of its untenability this is as good as a confession that he holds it provisionally as a likely hypothesis and not as an absolute certainty he is painfully aware that the very existence of his absolute spirit is problematical that outside certain extremely rare forms of mystical experience it is not discoverable by any experimental method known to man neither is it provable by any strict deduction from known laws of the existent he cannot uphold it either as a conclusion or as a necessary presupposition of all thinking all he can say is that his hypothesis does not conflict with any proved certainty and that it seems to him to cover more facts than any other that has been put forth hitherto he might even urge that there are some facts the outer fringe of which no other hypothesis so much as touches this brings us to the end of our reasoned arguments end of chapter eight part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine Chapter Eight, Parts Two through Four, Section One 
of a defence of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eight conclusions part two throughout the foregoing metaphysical discussion one point must have struck the unmetaphysical reader as it certainly strikes the mere writer that a good half of the problems under consideration arose solely from the limitations of language we can argue with perfect propriety as to whether things are or are not out of time and out of space and whether one body is or is not outside another body and whether it is a part or a whole and if a part whether of this whole or that of things occupying space we can argue as to whether they run parallel to each other or not or whether they stand at the circumference or the centre but when it comes to discussing whether things are inside or outside of consciousness whether consciousness is a part or a whole whether if it runs it runs parallel with physical processes or runs altogether in some other manner whether if it stands it stands at the circumference or the centre and whether consciousness stands or runs at all it seems almost obvious that we are being made the victims of our own metaphors idealists and realists seem to have suffered most from the confusion that results when the idealist says that the world arises in consciousness quite palpably he lies but when the realist says that consciousness arises in the world he is no nearer to the truth when he says that the world exists outside consciousness he can only mean that it exists outside his body when he says consciousness is a part of his pluriverse and not the whole what he means or should mean is that his body is a part of it again when the idealist says that consciousness is the centre of his universe again palpably he lies not because he has said too much but because he has said too little for when the realist swears by all his realities that consciousness stands at the circumference he is perjured when he reveals his pluriverse as an infinite number of entities mutually repellent yet coexisting even interpenetrating much as the infinite planes of space interpenetrate each other he may be getting at the truth of the matter as nearly as his spectacular methods will allow him but when he invites you to consider consciousness as only one of those entities standing to all the others in the relation of a spectator to a spectacle then in spite of all the useful distinctions that he makes between things in space and time and things out of space and time it is clear that he is visualizing consciousness as somehow occupying both if we once grasp the utter irrelevance of all this symbolic language as applying to consciousness and the relation of subject to object half the difficulties in accepting some conscious principle as the ultimate reality will have disappeared and the pluralist claim to have decentralized philosophy falls through after this the unphilosophic reader will perhaps see no reason why the idealist lamb should not lie down by the pluralist lion but the reason is clear enough the lamb does not do the smallest damage to the lion he does not interfere with any one of his adventures it is the lion that will not consent to live and let live the prestige of spirit is seriously endangered by the restrictions realism has laid on it but reality is not one whit the worse because idealism chooses to regard spirit as its source it is no more a dance of bloodless categories than it was before existence remains as full-blooded and gorgeously coloured as variegated and multitudinous as everlastingly exciting mysterious and surprising whether you call it the manifestation of spirit or a collection of ultimate realities the only question that concerns us is which theory is the more likely to be true we found that on a balance of the reasoned evidence we had some grounds for supposing spiritualistic monism more likely to be true than pluralistic realism and no valid grounds for supposing it to be false but if the reasoned evidence had failed us so far as to leave the balance even we should not then have despaired for we found a mass of evidence over and above which whether we regard it as springing from a higher and purer or from a lower and more troubled source than reason is not altogether to be gainsaid we found that one of our oldest deepest and most enduring possessions is the sense of the unseen 
we saw it grow from a primitive sense a blind and savage instinct to a transcendent spiritual passion we distinguished between the higher and the lower forms of mysticism we found that when criticism had done its worst it was possible to separate the purer from the baser elements of the same emotion and that after the most implacable analysis there remained something indestructible irreducible indefinable bearing its own peculiar certainty at the same time we acknowledged that the certainty of spiritual instinct is one thing and the certainty of reason is another and that the highest degree of certainty can only be reached when at all points the two corroborate and support each other such a degree of certainty we are very far from having reached though at some points we may have found this corroboration and support part three we have now to find the bearing of our conclusions such as they are on the question of personal immortality before we can do this however we shall have to consider certain evidence from other sources sources that we have left so far unexplored first of all there is the huge mass of that so-called evidence which the society for psychical research makes it its business to investigate and sift the evidence drawn from the communications of mediums from automatic writing from cross correspondence the alleged apparitions of the departed materializations and veridical dreams i do not propose to investigate and sift this evidence all over again people who are interested in spiritualism critically or otherwise should study the literature of the subject for themselves when they have read and digested the journals and proceedings of the society up to date and the records of foreign organizations devoted to the same adventure together with mr f w myers on human personality and sir oliver lodge's raymond they had better read mr frank podmore's studies in psychical research also i shall therefore be very brief briefly then we shall do well to distinguish between what are broadly speaking two kinds of evidence indirect communications made through mediums with their accompanying apparitions or materializations and direct communications made spontaneously and without any apparent machinery of suggestion such as veridical dreams and apparitions seen without the help of mediums under both these heads there is an enormous body of perfectly well authenticated testimony borne by irreproachable persons some of it but only a very little has even been brought forward by sceptical and indifferent persons persons without any interest in the result one way or another briefly again i think there cannot be a doubt in the mind of any unprejudiced person that both through the agency of mediums and otherwise things happen things that are not explainable by any trickery things interesting enough and even uncanny enough to charm the most fastidious lover of the occult unfortunately lovers of the occult are very seldom hampered in their researches by overfastidiousness. the question is what happens take the regular spiritualistic phenomena first mrs piper say seems to be giving messages from the spirits of mr myers or dr verall their authenticity seems to be sufficiently attested by allusions to intricate and subtle points of scholarship said to be known only to dr verall and mr myers the automatic writer writes words that she herself would never have dreamed of as if under an irresistible and supernatural compulsion what she has written tallies with something said to be known only to the departed hands are certainly seen to be waving where human hands are not bunches of flowers and even still more solid objects materialize apparently from nowhere out of nothing it cannot all be fraud all the time though some of it may be sometimes exposure in ninety-nine cases affords no absolutely valid grounds for denying that the hundredth case may be genuine what then is going on so far as psychical research has been carried yet i cannot see that even under the most carefully prepared test conditions there is an atom of evidence to show that what is going on is an actual communication or effort at communication of the discarnate with the incarnate it may be so but until we have eliminated every possible source of suggestion from the living we have no right to assume an even remote suggestion from the other side and to ensure this test condition we should have to exterminate the living the test will not be water-tight until the communicant is alone with the communicator and then there will only be his word for it 
on this side whatever spiritualism may be telepathy is a fact and whatever the precise limits and possibilities of telepathy may be we have not yet discovered them can we be sure that the things said to be known only to the discarnate are not among the subconscious memories of the communicant or of some person present at the seance or that they are not known by any living mind on earth nothing in the annals of psychical research is more astonishing than the series of cross correspondences in the case of mrs holland and mrs verrall mrs holland in india received by automatic writing one half of a supposed communication the other half was received by mrs verrall in england neither making sense by itself the two writers were unacquainted and each was unaware of what the other was doing the perfect dovetailing of the fragments could not be accounted for on any theory of coincidences the two writings clearly dealt with the same context for quotations from certain known poems broken off or garbled in one fragment were completed or emended by the other here the test conditions were all that could be desired it was a manifest case of tapping a wireless yet who could say that the probability of wireless from the living was ruled out the state of desire and expectancy in which all these efforts to communicate are made renders the minds of the investigators peculiarly open to suggestion and an extremely important point the more transparently honest the mind the more passive it will be therefore the more open and if the messages are suspect what shall we say of the manifestations in these cases how can we possibly rule out suggestion certain experiments have been made by Janet and his son on their patients at the salpetriere which show that both positive and negative hallucinations can be produced by suggestion the patient that is to say can be made not only to see things that are not there and to behave as if they were there but not to see things that are there and to behave as if they were not there both hallucinations remaining intact until the experimenter releases the enchanted one from her enchantment and not only eminent alienists but obscure amateurs have done as much why then should not the magic of the medium be equally effective why should not an expert suggester create both positive and negative hallucinations at will is it a question of pocketing the sendings and taking them home with you why should he not introduce into the blankly innocent scene all the paraphernalia of materialization he requires by simply inhibiting the perception of them until the moment comes for handing round the evidential trophies this would account for the indubitably solid objects the plaster casts of spirit hands the flowers the little girls and the teaspoons which have figured at certain twentieth-century seances however this may be if psychical researchers are not increasing their knowledge of the other side they are preparing excellent material for psychologists on this side the other sort of evidence the direct and spontaneous sort is i think in rather better case it would be stupid to deny that there have been well authenticated apparitions and so-called veridical dreams which appeal to our belief because of their directness and spontaneity by the fact that they have come to people who were not looking for them in many cases to people who would have gone out of their way to avoid them if they had known that they were coming the sudden unexpectedness of these encounters through the veridical dream and the valedictory apparition is in their favour but here again the possibility of telepathy between the living is by no means ruled out so far if i am not mistaken most of the verified or verifiable instances of apparitions have occurred not after death but before it or at the actual moment of passing and cannot be taken as evidence of survival the vision of the dead body may be explained by suggestion from the living attendants of the dead so may the instance of the dream that comes true and there is always coincidence there remain certain also well authenticated cases of the continuous apparition the ghost that haunts it seems hardly likely that they are all the products of a disordered brain or a habit of mendacity but i have never come across any more satisfactory explanation of them we may invent hypotheses to account for them for instance that the impact of all visible and audible events is continued in an infinite series of finer and finer vibrations the swing as it were of infinitely divisible etheric particles so that long after the date of the original event its ghostly simulacra are seen or heard by senses pitched to their rates of vibration 
but even if some unforeseen discovery in physics were to give encouragement to this theory it would involve a corresponding theory of an infinite series of finer and finer senses pitched to the finer and finer vibrations and even if this received encouragement from psychology we should still be no nearer knowing why some of these events should be perceived and not others and we should be as far as ever from any evidence of survival there is yet another very ancient and widespread belief on which many people still found their hope of personal immortality the belief in reincarnation if the belief itself were well founded it would be as good a foundation as we could wish to have if we have lived many times before there is to say the least of it an antecedent probability that we shall live again there would even be no reason why we should ever stop living now there are three theories of reincarnation and two of them are mutually exclusive one is primitive and savage one ancient and pseudo-metaphysical one modern and if not scientific fairly well founded on scientific grounds according to the primitive and savage belief we are all reincarnations of the dead ghosts are germs and germs are ghosts as the flower and the corn return to earth we return the ghosts of the newly dead hang about in woods and at crossroads for choice waiting for women to pass by that they may enter their bodies and be born again the places where they hang about are haunted places according to the second and most fascinating form of the belief which involves the doctrine of karma we are born again and again as full-blown human individuals breaking through the knitted chain of the generations at points that may be divided by many ages according to the third we have been incarnate again and again in the bodies of our parents and our ancestors in such sort that the chain of generation is never broken this as we have seen is the doctrine of panpsychism observe that both the primitive and the modern theory are the most satisfactory and courageous in tackling the crux of reincarnation its modus operandi the theory of karma leaves this essential part of the problem altogether too vague and i am bound to confess that it is the savage who scores in simplicity and precision but it is the theory involving karma that people mean when they talk about reincarnation it exerts an irresistible fascination for certain temperaments that would be repelled by the panpsychism of samuel butler or of anybody else the belief has been for ages the actual living belief of millions in india china and japan in spite of its inherent difficulties it is still more or less sincerely held by many perfectly sane people in europe and america at the present day you used to meet them at the ritz or rumpelmeyer's it was in the days before the war when they would tell you as a matter of course that they remembered being a dancer at the court of amenhotep the third or the queen consort of ashurbanipal or a concubine of sennacherib or a priestess in the temple of krishna or a great hetera of the age of pericles the odd thing is that the reincarnated have always been something royal or hieratic or improper something sufficiently afar from the sphere of their sorrow eastern or egyptian preferred something whatever it may be that they are not now and they expect you to believe them they are not content to have taken part in the thousand or the million incarnations of their own ancestors in a thousand or a million experiences they are not content with their thousandth or their millionth share in the adventures of the dancer at the court of amenhotep the third they want all the adventure to themselves it is the full-blown dancing individual they claim to have been and the plain facts of biology are all against it you cannot thus break through the unbroken chain of the generations the difficulty for the devotees of this form of reincarnation is not that there is no proof that they have never lived before but that there is too much proof that they have never stopped living they have never escaped from the chain until the day when they were born as the individual they are now end of chapter eight parts two through four section one Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 8, Parts 2 through 4, Section 2 of A Defense of Idealism by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 8, Conclusions. Parts 2 through 4, Section 2.
panpsychism is a theory not of reincarnation but of continuous incarnation and unless there are grounds and i have tried to show that there are grounds for supposing that the self is something over and above its own experience its own memories and its own organism the mere fact that we have never stopped living so far is no guarantee that we shall go on living after the final dissolution of that organism but if we have appropriated it rather than inherited it our previous existence becomes i think a very considerable guarantee now it may be objected that this self over and above is a pure blank yet it seems to be all that is left to us and if the pure self is as pure as that what good is it to anybody if there is nothing in it how is it going to carry on and to carry us on i own that it doesn't look as if the self over and above could give much support to the hope of immortality or that in its nakedness it is likely to appeal to the plain man the pure self is not looked upon with favour even by idealists kant who as good as discovered it fought shy of it realists are fond of reminding you that you cannot prove existence you can only perceive it is there then any reasonable sense in which it can be said to exist if it isn't perceived and if it isn't memory if it isn't consciousness what is it my friend dr mctaggart says it is nothing and its blankness must seem to many people every bit as terrifying as the blankness of death yet it is in this pure self that i am asking you to put your trust for all these objections rest on the monstrous assumption that what you cannot perceive does not exist and is not real and this is to claim greater authority for finite and human perception than it can possibly possess remember it is only the purity of the self that is so universally objected to and the self is not more pure more utterly beyond touch and sight than space and time are it is not more empty to perception than matter is in the last analysis and we saw what dangers and dilemmas we avoided by putting selfhood where the plain man unaware of its purity puts it first personally i am not dismayed by this blankness of the self behind me rather because of it i can face the blankness before me without flinching i can conceive all my memory that is to say all the experience i had acquired in this life everything that makes me recognizable and dear to myself and to other people i cannot only conceive but think of it as going from me with my death and of myself as yet continuing i would rather keep that experience intact i have already lost much by simple casual forgetting and if i have lived long enough i may have lost all that is worth keeping of it i had rather keep that memory and carry it over with me for the living interest of the thing but if i am driven to conclude that i must lose it i do not therefore think of myself as lost it may be that here again a more perfect forgetting is as it was before the condition of a more perfect consciousness i know that i could and probably shall embrace a wholly new experience with the same eager interest with which i have embraced the old for through forgetfulness of my past lives my present life began to all intents and purposes as a blank an experience that i knew nothing of and that knew nothing of me and supposing that no vehicle of individuality such as my body was awaits me at the instant of death supposing that no refined simulacrum of my body exists either as an inner or outer vehicle or as an interpenetrating and energizing substance inscrutably present with my physical body and enduring after my death many quite sane people believe in such a vehicle on evidence i know nothing about except that it satisfies them supposing that no such vehicle is at my disposal and that i have to wait untold ages before i can find one or the germ of one in order to appear and to be conscious again those untold ages will not trouble me they will no doubt exist as the time schemes of other consciousnesses other thoughts and other emotions other selves living at another pace and with another intensity will beat out the measure and will keep the record of those times just as some superhuman and superorganic consciousness must have kept the record and beaten out the measure of prehuman and preorganic times they do not concern me in the first instant that i am conscious again my world arises 
as if there had been no age-long break no break at all not so much as an infinitesimally small interval and i shall conceive my world as without beginning and without end the actual break is the worst that can happen to me and whether it be long or short i shall know nothing of it it may be still objected that in cutting the self adrift from memory i am burning the only ship that will bring me safe to shore but this implies that the underwriters have insured that ship and will continue to insure her which is very far from being the case i am leaving an unseaworthy vessel whose foundering if she does founder will sink me with her to the bottom i might possibly be afraid to sink with the ship to drown batten down with the rats in the hold but for the probability that neither i nor the rats would know anything about it i am not in the least afraid to throw myself into the open sea but this theory of panpsychism provides another and a stronger argument for human immortality it supposes that all life and the evolution of every living organism depends on the desire and the design of an indestructible psyche and that under favourable conditions when the desire and the design have been strong enough and suitable they have been fulfilled and as far as the living organism goes design has followed slavishly desire so that if the human psyche has a strong desire for immortality and if its design is in accordance with that desire immortality in spite of the fact that it is a large order should follow there are few arguments for personal immortality that have not some danger and this argument for human instinct and desire is imperilled by the objection that this particular instinct and desire is by no means universal and that no psychic design so far as we know in any way depends on it it may be distinctly lacking in highly civilized societies the less instinctive and the more intellectual man becomes the more he is apt to repudiate both the belief in immortality and the desire and the hope of it the belief apparently rests on instinct but the desire and the hope do not seem to be as instinctive or at any rate as primitive as the belief where the belief is practically universal as among savages the life after death and all that belongs to it are dreaded rather than desired the savage may desire the dead man's strength his mana but the discarnate ghost itself is a thing of terror and the belief is more a belief in survival than in immortality for the primitive mind is a child's mind it cannot grasp the idea of any long period of definite time much less the idea of immortality the hope and the desire are virile instincts with one apparent exception they seem to have dominated the youth of the race and its maturity to belong to those stages of its development that lie between primitive savagery and extreme civilization and to be intimately associated with the rise and decline of personal religion the one exception which is the stock argument against the belief in personal immortality is of course buddhism buddhism it is said the ancient and permanent religion of millions of the human race is a religion founded on the negation of immortality and wherever it exists it is the religion not of a handful of metaphysicians but of the priesthood and the common people and as with the progress of science and speculative thought the belief tends to disappear so with the progress of civilization the desire itself weakens it is not only that the intellectuals doubt or disbelieve for intellectual reasons and spread their doubt or disbelief through all the circles that they influence other and simpler people are indifferent and the root of their indifference is moral and physical rather than intellectual the belief in immortality is no longer popular at any rate it has no longer the vogue it once had and we have reason to be cautious in approaching it when we find the distinguished historian of the origin of this belief regarding it with a half amused and half disdainful scepticism it must be confessed that the result of sir james fraser's researches are not such as to make sensitive people in love with the belief in human immortality they are not such as to make intelligent people conclude that there is anything in humanity that deserves to endure even for a day it is quite possible to bring forward an array of facts to show that the whole history of this pitiful race is one long record of cowardice and uncleanness 
cruelty and imbecility listen to these two voices that debate the destiny of man surely they say such a glorious creature was not born for mortality to be snuffed out like a candle to fade like a flower to pass away like a breath is all that penetrating intellect that creative fancy that vaulting ambition those noble passions those far-reaching hopes to come to nothing to shrink up into a pinch of dust it is not so it cannot be shall a creature so frail and puny claim to live for ever to outlast not only the present starry system but every other that when earth and stars have crumbled into dust shall be built upon their ruins in the long long hereafter it is not so it cannot be those who take this view of the transitoriness of man compared with the vastness and permanence of the universe find little in the beliefs of savages to alter their opinion they see in the savage conception of the soul and its destiny nothing but a product of childish ignorance the hallucinations of hysteria the ravings of insanity or the concoctions of deliberate fraud and imposture you see the historian trying to hold the balance scrupulously even but there is little doubt as to which of those two voices is the more insistent he also reminds us that buddhism is a conspicuous and extensive and damaging fact and when we remember that our positive metaphysical arguments rest on the slender foothold of debatable hypothesis and that we were obliged to fall back on the biological and psychological arguments from desire and design and that these arguments apparently cannot stand the light of an impartial historical survey when we are reminded further that william james prefaced his immortal essay on immortality with the emphatic statement that he personally had no desire for it whatever it looks as if the prospects for human immortality were black as if we should have after all to content ourselves with the negative encouragement we are at least sure of the impossibility of proving that it cannot be yet we were in worse case a little while back when we tried to discover whether mysticism had anything in it that escaped the violence of its detractors we found then that for all its dubious or disgraceful history and for all its elements of grossness and absurdity there was something intangible and invulnerable that escaped we found that you might as well judge poetry by the practice of the worst poetasters as judge mysticism by the practice of its worst exponents or by the lapses of its best and so i think that if we look closer we shall find for one thing that in spite of its savage history there is nothing either absurd or ignoble in the belief in immortality itself to begin with the belief has been evolved it has not remained in its primitive savagery and even in its primitiveness it was not after all such a very imbecile belief it arose in the first place from a most intelligent and reasonable desire for fertility the ghost imagined as surviving was originally the source of mana the mysterious power of life the savage tribesman had no personal aspirations he did not think of himself as a person therefore he took short views and it did not occur to him that he might eventually become a spirit and the source of power he only aspired to get power to get life from season to season to be fruitful and to bring fruitfulness to his trees and grain and to his flocks and herds he buried the seed and he saw that it came up again as a green blade he buried his father and he looked for him to come up again in children born to the tribe there must have been an immense step between this primitive idea of subjective immortality and the idea of the ghost's life as independent and continuous first of all the ghost is a buried underground thing it is later that he moves about on the face of the earth and becomes the dreadful supernatural thing the haunter the watcher by the crossroads and the sacred tree much later then he becomes the departed who has journeyed to the islands of the blessed and will not return apparently it is not until this stage is reached that it occurs to primitive man that he may very well live again like his fathers and that where they have gone he may go it is later still that he conceives the idea of the spiritual dying and new birth and with it the passion for god and the desire of immortality for its own sake yet not altogether for its own sake he wants to be wherever his gods are 
when he has once for all placed his god in heaven rather than under the earth it is to heaven that he wants to go the desire of immortality is one thing then and the primitive belief in a survival on earth is another and the desire of immortality comes last and comes with man's consciousness of himself as an immaterial being immaterial therefore immortal he desires to be what he is not yet but he does not desire it until he is ready for it until he knows it to be possible and in all this his religion is not the driving and compelling power it follows the lead of the developing and dominant desire it once centred round his natural and tribal life then around his social life it now centres round his individual and spiritual life that is all the individual is adapting himself to the wider reality that his prophetic need discerns presently he seeks metaphysical grounds for his belief and ethical justification for his desire last of all in the decadence of over-civilized races when they are about to be conquered by the younger and the stronger race the belief and the hope and the desire of immortality weaken and die this is where the passionate concentration on origins would seem to be misleading it diverts attention from the fact that there are such things as ends the study of what has been is important it is interesting but it is interesting and it is important chiefly as throwing light on what is and what will be which are even more important and more interesting than it so that when we see the thing through its history does not show up this belief as ignoble infantile and absurd it shows the desire for immortality strengthening with man's youth and his maturity and declining and decaying only with his weakness and decay it has been said that wherever the belief has existed it has proved harmful therefore contrary to the design of the psyche in its organism therefore destined to disappear this objection also ignores what has happened and is happening it is true that there has always been a disastrous period of transition when man has not yet adjusted the claims of his natural and spiritual life when he has been so unaware of the metaphysical grounds of his immortality that he has tried to bargain with his god for it to buy his soul's life with the sacrifice of his body the cruelties and violences of asceticism prove that he was by no means sure that his passion for god and immortality was requited this period may stand for the crisis of spiritual adolescence with its uncertainty and disturbance and self-torture the passion for god and immortality are no more discredited by it than human passion is by the physical crisis of its coming it is also true that the nineteenth century was a vigorous and virile century yet disbelief in immortality was then almost de rigueur among people with any pretensions to scientific training but this was partly because the first triumphs of physical science had turned the heads of its professors it may be observed that professor huxley did not discover his mechanical equivalent of consciousness he lived in fact to recant so far as to confess that nature could not possibly have evolved the laws of ethics which exist in violent opposition to nature's laws and the twentieth century is not unanimously backing the illusory by-product theory of consciousness in any century the desire of immortality or at any rate of life after death is a sign of youth and vitality and vigour in those who feel it keenly the strong man wants to go on living to have more and more outlet for his energies to do more to feel more to know more he wants it instinctively for the stronger and healthier he is the less he is likely to think about it at all when he is old and weak and worn out or young and weak and bored to premature extinction with living he does think about it he wants not instinctively but consciously to lie down and go to sleep to stop the intolerable nuisance of living end of parts two through four section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eight parts two through four section three of a defense of idealism by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eight conclusions parts two through four section three 
on the whole then the argument from desire and design holds good it is the weak and inefficient the unwise in the affairs of life the bunglers and the failures the bankrupts and the unhappy lovers who most want to leave off living think of the number of suicides that occur every year through bankruptcy and unhappy love alone count in the suicides through poverty and remember that these are all people whose vitality has been lowered by worry or frustrated passion and starvation and that their aim is to end life and not to obtain it more abundantly count in the philosophers who profess a noble indifference to the issue and still a suspicion of lowered vitality arises and if suicide is to be reprobated on the grounds that it is dishonourable and selfish the desire to go on living cannot very well be reprobated on the same grounds its motive may be and often is the passion for metaphysical truth and for a righteousness not obtainable on earth it may be and often is in the highest degree aesthetic for the universe as it stands is ethically and aesthetically incomplete it has a certain significance for our peculiarly human consciousness which never for one moment sees it where we may tails off into insignificance it appeals to us in an incalculable number of intensely exciting sentences which it hurls at our heads and leaves provokingly unfinished it has made us spectators of its stupendous drama what is more it has honoured us with free passes as critics of the performance worse still it involves us personally in important and dramatic situations which it leaves undeveloped it involves itself in perpetual engagements to us which hitherto it has not fulfilled it creates desires which certainly cannot be satisfied in one lifetime or in the conditions of the only life we know there is some evidence that it has created or is creating powers in us whose exercise demands another and more extensive sphere and we find it preposterous that a universe which has unbent so far as to consider us in this programme should leave us ultimately in the lurch and when we look back on the long course of our pre-human history we judge that if life does turn traitor at the last it will be behaving contrary to all precedent there should be no arraignment of nature so sweeping as to obscure the fact that there has been precedent organic forms locked in the infernal struggle for existence have after all evolved and the struggle has been an important factor in their evolution eliminate catastrophe the wholesale fortuitous destruction of living forms by storm and flood and sudden changes in environment and the encounter with inorganic conditions disastrous to any life eliminate waste the careless handling of the vehicle of life the fate of the germs that have never had a chance to develop eliminate the struggle of the already evolved the slaughter accomplished by one species on another and by individuals within the species assume with panpsychism that fitness is the expression of the individual's desire to survive and it will be seen that nature has not behaved unfairly to her organisms after all she has destroyed countless forms of the unfit in whom we may presuppose no very keen desire to survive she has preserved at their original low level millions of humble forms whose desire was chiefly that they might stay there but she has rewarded greatly the great desires the great ambitions the great accomplishments she has even more rewarded the small desires the small ambitions that were faithful and persistent nature abhors incompetence but apparently no patient and efficient psyche ever desired the physical vehicle or tool that it did not obtain no appropriate need was left long unsatisfied no organ left to wither by disuse as long as its function was appropriate and the fulfilment of that function desired if we may assume with panpsychism that need and desire were prophetic that is to say always a little in advance of the actual conditions without which advanced evolution would seem to have been impossible the analogy is complete and we are justified in asking why pursue this policy of indulgence to all the ambitious animal forms and stop short at man may he not go on doing what he did in his mother's womb what he has been doing ever since his psyche and the first speck of protoplasm came together why this sudden arbitrary prohibition now just when he is beginning to be interested in the universe around him as well as in his own performance 
now if there is anything in panpsychism this argument will stand whether we are pluralists or monists but i believe it will have most support from the theory which presupposes that there is one ruler the self within all things who makes the one form manifold there is one eternal thinker thinking non-eternal thoughts who though one fulfils the desires of many buddhism alone the great exception stands we are told in the way of the argument from desire but is buddhism really so obstructive as it is said to be isn't it just possible that the great exception may prove the rule consider how it came by its doctrine of nirvana granting for the moment that by nirvana it means what we mean by extinction as far as it is a theory and not a religion buddhism presupposes the metaphysical doctrine of the absolute laid down in the upanishads so far as it is a religion it is founded on compassion and pity and the revolt against the cruelty of caste the revolt against caste itself presupposes some influence from the doctrine of brahma the great self in whom all men and all things are one on its metaphysical side the nirvana of the buddhist is the state of union with the absolute or if you like the utter extinction of the individual as such on its religious side it is the ceasing from the sorrow of divided life desire is the cause of life which is the cause of sorrow therefore nirvana the state of blessedness is attained by simply ceasing to desire metaphysically nirvana is the state of pure absolute unconditioned being it is the very last and subtlest refinement of the one of the vedas the great self of the upanishads defined by contradictions and negations nirvana is defined only by negations the mystic of the upanishads says who is able to know that self who rejoices and rejoices not the buddhist of the suttas goes one better who is able to know that he does not know if the sixth stage of mental deliverance is to think that nothing at all exists the seventh stage is the passing quite beyond all idea of nothingness to a state to which neither ideas nor the absence of ideas is specially present and that is topped by the eighth stage in which nothing is affirmed and nothing is denied but both sensations and ideas have ceased to be this is the mental discipline by which thought reaches up to nirvana the state which transcends thought it is ecstasy of contemplation you may say that buddhism ends where hegelianism begins with the statement that being and non-being are the same that it reverses the movement of the triple dialectic that instead of resolving the contradiction in the synthetic affirmation of becoming it proceeds by way of the negation of becoming the denial of the world of appearances to its definition of being buddhism is the denial of all the metaphysical systems that were before it you might think a metaphysical system did not matter but it matters horribly a metaphysical system is a deadly thing it may bind a man to the wheel of life by giving him wrong ideas about reality in the sutta of all the asavas or book of the deadly things you will read of the six delusions of metaphysical thought i have a self i have not a self by myself i am conscious of myself by myself i am conscious of my not self this soul of mine can be perceived it has experienced the result of good and evil actions committed here and there this soul of mine is permanent lasting eternal unchangeable it will endure for ever and ever the delusion consists not in having these ideas but in ascribing truth and reality to them you may say that buddhism lands you in utter nescience since it denies every conceivable statement that can be made about reality but observe the nature of the denial in each case it is the negation of a negation in the supreme interests of the absolute buddhism denies the reality of the appearing world it strips being bare of each unreal quality one by one till not one shred of illusion is left clinging to it beyond this it makes no affirmation or denial as the qualities are expressly stated to be unreal the stripping process is anything but negation it is the affirmation of reality carried to passion and excess so that the unreal individual life must therefore be held to be utterly extinguished in nirvana but it is hardly even an open question whether nirvana is or is not a state of being 
a pure and perfect bliss beyond speech beyond sense beyond thought beyond dream and desire or any form of consciousness we know to define it as the buddhist defines it by a series of negations is simply a way of saying with the utmost metaphysical hyperbole that where there is nothing there is all but whatever esoteric buddhism might have said or meant it was not entirely with that seemingly unreal glamour that it charmed the heart of asia for everything that was lacking in nirvana it made up by its very robust and substantial doctrine of reincarnation to disciples who had no fancy for extinction it offered an endless and exciting round of rebirth nobody forced nirvana on you if you didn't want it you could postpone your flight to the absolute practically to all eternity by a judicious system of backsliding you had only to neglect some obvious duty in each life as you returned to it to ensure another return in fact you had not even to do that you had only to desire to live again and you lived your karma might indeed force you back again against your will but then you are responsible for your karma the whole thing is in your own hands desire binds you to the wheel of life desire shapes your destiny for you within the wheel your desire not god's not anybody else's it is panpsychism all over again you grow your own organism because you want to this amounts to personal immortality as much immortality as you want and for as long as you want it so that buddhism should really not be used by sceptics to justify their scepticism one imagines that buddhists who declare for nirvana in preference to reincarnation are the decadents and the professors of philosophy and the mystics who know what they know but there is a third objection that may be made in the beginning we found the perfection of individuality in perfect adaptation to reality and it may be said that the argument from desire overlooks the compulsion that is laid on the individual to conform things are not in his own hands the will to live is not his will from step to step the psyche follows in the line set by a reality outside it of which its physical organism is part the panpsychist looks at the process from the inside adaptation he says does not suggest that the individual's will is coerced and determined by the reality outside and beyond him since it could not have taken place at all but for the individual's inner disposition or will all the same physical or spiritual death will be the price of his utter defiance the individual must adapt himself or go under and if that is not coercion i own it looks uncommonly like it yet consider what on the panpsychist theory has really happened that the individual's psyche has been present throughout the entire experience of the race and that the individual could never have been what he is at each moment of his ascension if he had not needed wanted desired and willed to be something that he was not yet consider that he would never have grown never have developed at all would be limited as many unambitious individuals are for all time to the companionship of the original speck of protoplasm he first took up with even if he advanced to the cell stage without what strikes the outsider as his insane ambition to grow another cell he would have remained a unicellular organism all his life therefore on the very supposition that his earliest adaptations were to a reality as yet outside and beyond him his earliest developments must have entailed some slight defiance of the existing order and his earliest need was a prophetic need and when we come to the human individual his latest and highest developments mean a very considerable defiance of existing order a very considerable prophetic need and his latest and highest efforts at adaptation show an audacity that still suggests defiance rather than submission whatever it may look like from outside adaptation seen from within as the panpsychist sees it looks much more like the fulfilment of desire than its coercion if the perfect individual is the self perfectly adapted to reality through the successive sublimations of his will the monist will grant you the compulsion you insist on if the laws of nature are the laws of the appearance of the self in whom all selves arise and have their being the compulsion that is upon the selves to obey them is not an outside compulsion it is the compulsion of their own nature in its will to appear part three 
to sum up the metaphysical argument that we left behind us it supposes one infinite and absolute spirit manifesting itself in many forms to many finite spirits it supposes the selves of the many finite spirits to receive and to maintain their reality in and through the one infinite self as truly as their organisms received and maintained their life through its appearance as one life force for though the finite selves may exist over and above their organisms and their experience and apart from each other they do not subsist they are not over and above and apart from the one self in whom they have their reality but the finite selves may be supposed to be potentially infinite since they have conceived infinity it would seem hardly worth while for the infinite spirit to have revealed himself so far if the tremendous and significant process was not to be carried on appearances may be unreal but they are significant why be at the pains of accumulating experiences through countless generations if the whole is to be squandered in one passionate instant of death but on the theory it will not by any means follow that if we survive we shall survive as the individuals we are now or even as individuals at all selfhood as we have seen is not necessarily individuality if ourselves existed at all before birth they would seem to have existed as members of a group self or as mysterious partakers in the experiences of millions of individuals anyhow in a manner utterly incompatible with individuality as we understood it here and now and yet on that theory selfhood seemed to have been very efficiently maintained even in our experience here and now though our selfhood would seem to remain inviolable our individuality holds its own precariously at times and with difficulty against the forces that tend to draw us back to our racial consciousness again the facts of multiple personality telepathy and suggestion the higher as well as the lower forms of dream consciousness indicated that our psychic life is not a watertight compartment but has porous walls and is continually threatened with leakage and the flooding in of many streams it may be that individuality is only one stage and that not the highest and the most important stage in the real life process of the self it may be that a self can only become a perfect self in proportion as it takes on the experiences of other selves just as it could only become a perfect individual by taking on the experience of millions of other individuals the individual that is to say may have to die that the self may live on the theory this sacrifice would not mean what is called subjective immortality but rather the very opposite in subjective immortality the individual lives precariously in the memory of posterity which may after all prefer to forget him in any case it is a form of consciousness to which on this theory he has contributed but does not share he has no consciousness of anything any more at all but the life after death of the perfected self would mean an enormous increase of consciousness through a spiritual communion in which all that is imperfect in passion all that is tentative in compassion and insight and inspiration is finished and complete but the greatest objection to the acceptance of this form of monism turns on the difficulty not to say the impossibility of conceiving how the selfhood of the finite selves is maintained in and through their fusion with the infinite self now there are certain forms of dream consciousness in which precisely such a transfusion is apparently effected and maintained i can vouch for one authentic dream which began in the most ordinary fashion by the dreamer imagining a complex dramatic situation involving three persons not counting the dreamer herself the situation itself was normal and imagined in a perfectly normal way without a single element of fantasy the dreamer so far was simply dreaming the outline of a very ordinary novel or a play but no sooner did the outline and the parts to be played by the three persons become clear then the dreamer became the three persons and experienced in one and the same moment three sets of emotions all distinct from each other two of which were conflicting and two downright contradictory she accomplished in one and the same moment through the three persons three distinct and different acts two of which were mutually exclusive besides maintaining three distinct and appropriate attitudes to the total event while playing with perfect difference yet perfect unity these three parts in the drama 
the dreamer also stood apart and looked on an unprejudiced and unmoved yet interested spectator the actors who appeared as very vividly incarnate bore no sort of resemblance to the dreamer or to any person known to her from beginning to end not only three distinct experiences but three distinct selfhoods were preserved in one experience and one selfhood it may be objected that as dreams are hallucinations we cannot argue from what happens in a dream to what may happen in reality that under analysis this particular dream presents no more remarkable features than any other dream and that the peculiar qualities claimed for it are classic features of the freudian hypocritical dream multiplication of the dreamer's person by substitution of other persons and representation of events consecutive in time by juxtaposition in space the third objection which might have been serious does not hold good of this dream emotions and moral attitudes and the sense of personal identity whether simple and distinct or complex and transfused are not representations in space either in dream consciousness or in any other and in the dream they were not symbolized but felt in the perfect intimate immediacy of feeling and the other objections are beside the point it does not matter whether dreams are or are not hallucinations it does not matter what interpretation we put upon this dream or what elements it yields under analysis dream consciousness is a form of consciousness like another it has its own reality it is not claimed for this dream that a real transfusion of consciousness and of selves took place in it only that it gave a perfect and indubitable sense of such transfusion of what it would feel like if the transfusion did take place also that as the dream was at least clear enough and coherent enough to be remembered and analyzed by the dreamer there remained in waking consciousness a valid conception of the whole synthetic event a synthetic event which was said to be inconceivable ruling out irrelevant objections then there are only three points that need concern us we have in this dream consciousness a plurality of illusory consciousnesses a plurality of illusory selves held together by one real self and existing in and through and for one real consciousness and that without loss to the integrity of one illusory item of the illusory complex without any rupture of the unity of the one self the complex is illusory only by comparison with the peculiar reality of waking consciousness it however exists it has its own dream reality it arises presumably because the dream consciousness is free from those conditions of real space and real time which determines the psychophysical life of the individual when awake for illusory read finite and you have an exact rendering of the situation assumed by pantheistic monism a plurality of finite consciousnesses a plurality of finite selves held together by one real self existing in and through and for one real consciousness and that without loss to the integrity of one finite item of the finite complex without rupture to the unity of the one self you may say that the finite complex is unreal only by comparison with the peculiar reality of the infinite real it has its own reality and you may say that the situation assumed by the monist presupposes a corresponding transcendence of the conditions of finite space and finite time the one infinite spirit then is the finite selves that the selves are not conscious of this union is the tragedy of their finitude in our present existence we are spirit but so limited in our experience that we know the appearances of spirit far better than we know spirit itself if we knew them all and if in order to know them it so happened that we increased the pace of the rhythm of time as it is increased in our dream consciousness only to an immeasurably more intense degree the chances are that we should know spirit not as it appears but as it is appearances would be whirled for us as it were into the one reality as the colours of the spectrum painted on a revolving disc are whirled into one whiteness by the sheer rapidity of its revolutions there are after all different kinds of certainty and all our certainties that count here and now come to us after this fashion our inner states do succeed each other at different rates of vibration 
and what escapes us on the slow steady swing we seize when the pace quickens our perceptions like our passions maintain themselves at higher and lower intensities it is with such rapid flashes of the revolving disc with such hurrying of the rhythm of time with such heightening of psychic intensity that we discern reality here and now no reasoning allows or accounts for these moments but lovers and poets and painters and musicians and mystics and heroes know them moments when eternal beauty is seized travelling through time moments when things that we have seen all our lives without truly seeing them the flowers in the garden the trees in the field the hawthorn on the hillside change to us in an instant of time and show the secret and imperishable life they harbour moments when the human creature we have known all our life without truly knowing it reveals its incredible godhead moments of danger that are moments of sure and perfect happiness because then the adorable reality gives itself to our very sight and touch there is no arguing against certainties like these end of chapter eight recording by expatria in bangor maine end of a defense of idealism by may sinclair